Hello fellow sim racers and welcome to Redline Motorsport TV. We're here for the Silverstone Real World Racing Drivers event. We have, as the name suggests, Real World Racing Drivers. We have some of the top Assetto Corsa Competizione eSport drivers, as well as a smattering of influencers and a couple of the Kunos devs here to provide what hopes to be some fantastic racing. I'm Chris Hay, you'll know me potentially from YouTube, and I'm joined here in the commentary box by Simon from RLM. How are you doing, Simon? Yeah, not too bad. Chris, uh, how about yourself? Yeah, I am looking forward to this. The race we had in Kyle Army a couple of weeks ago, my first event for RLM was absolutely fantastic, and I can't wait for some more incredibly close racing. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, we are at Silverstone today, so the weather is looking... Uh typical british weather here so a bit of drizzle at silverstone um so yeah it's going to be uh the main commentators today will be chris we've got jesse and we've got george and we've also got ryan as well who will be one of the live stewards it's giving you the uh, information of any penalties given so yeah so i'll be mainly being the cameraman and we've got jesse here who will be the second commentator there so how are you doing jesse hello simon and i am excited today is one of those days that i have i'm having a bit of deja vu because of the people in the commentary box but also i'm really excited to see how this race is going to shake down it's our second go at having esports pros and real life drivers in the same race and i can't wait to get excited and back to that deja vu for the second day in a row we're joined by george smith hello george How's it, JC? How's it, Chris? How's it, Simon? Uh, great to join you guys here, JC. We did have a great, exciting race last night. Uh, we had very, very wet conditions there. Here, things are going to be exciting, though. We've got a light drizzle for the esports pros, real life drivers, and influencers to race on. So I'm pretty excited. And doing live stewarding for us, we've got Ryan here as well. Yeah, thank you, George. It's uh, it's nice to be here. I've missed out on the last couple of special races that we've had here through, uh, well, some racing that I had at Kiel Army that didn't go too well. And uh, then, of course, had a few issues the other night, so I wasn't able to commentate. But I am here to do some live stewarding today, so I'll be bringing you all the news from around the circuit about why anyone will be receiving penalties. And uh, I can shed some light onto any questions people might have regarding incidents that happen throughout the race. So, is it fair to say all bribes relating to racing incidents go are addressed to uh, to you, sir? Oh yes, my uh, my PayPal is open to donations, and um, I will be accepting uh, any dr any bribes of uh, substantial amounts of money. To be fair, though, the racing was of such high quality last time in Kyle Army that I don't think we're going to be seeing too much in the way of uh, penalties for racing incidents. That could be a commentator's curse moment very early in the broadcast. But uh, I think the thing I'd like to highlight right from the start is that we've just been watching a bit of free practice as the cars are coming out uh, just to start their qualifying runs at the moment, so we don't really have an indicator of pace. But during that free practice time, unlike Kiel Army, we had two real world drivers topping the times, mixing up with the esports guys. So, uh, Jesse, that's uh, that's a bit of a change in the form book. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be an interesting race for a lot of reasons, because for one, we're at Silverstone. It's very interesting, too, because it's a fairly flat track. And I'm not sure because we were talking, Chris, before this uh, this video or this stream went live, that there's some real world racing drivers who are making a push to the front, Chris. Yeah, it's one of those things where Assetto Corsa Competizione is a very detailed sim, and it's the sort of sim that when drivers really seem to get into it, it's the only thing they drive. They get incredibly dedicated to it. Uh, so with the complexities of it, there's, there's quite a lot to learn. So we have seen some real-world drivers maybe not struggling with outright pace, but just un struggling to understand the sort of little nuances that uh, come with learning the tyre model, and how to make the car quick over the length of a stint that really only come with experience. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the case here. So uh, yeah, a lot to look forward to. George, uh, is there anyone in particular in the field that you're looking forward to seeing race today? Uh, I think from the 
real life racing driver perspective, uh, definitely going to use a bit of bias being from South Africa, Zahir Esser. Uh, he's a man that I think we need to keep an eye out on. He's been one of those people, like you said, I don't think the, the real life drivers really have the same amount of hours in the sim that a lot of the pro guys have. So in the switchover, as they start to progress and put time in, uh, they start to pick it up more. And, and Zahir is someone that really has started to grind a lot of hours into this game. So pretty interested to see how he does. Um, on top of that, uh, whew, it's quite a mixture of drivers here. Again, uh, Alaric Enslin from RPM Motorsports, someone that I want to look out for. Probably Jason Absmai as well uh, for WRG. There's a couple of drivers that I'm not too familiar with that I kind of picked up from some of the streams that you guys have done before. So I'm here to learn a little bit as well. Uh, I'm always keen to see how the real life drivers do. Uh, obviously knowing that coming into things, they are at a disadvantage coming into this from the hours point of view, but with the real life knowledge on, on the racetrack, that's something that's kind of, you know, an advantage over esports drivers time and time again. So interested to really see how things pan out today. Yeah, we're on board with uh, Daniel Santoro, who did incredibly well at the Kyle Army event. Him and his teammate were uh, very much out the front of the field for the entire race, uh, battling out with the likes of Chris Hoker, who's just uh, put in the fastest time. Uh, wet track, two minutes and two seconds. That's a pretty quick time so far. So we're already seeing very, uh, very good pace at the front. And uh, names like uh, Samir Ibrahimi as well uh, will be familiar to anyone that watched Kyle Army races just for sort of people we would expect to be seeing at the front. They got out early, they're setting early times and they're pretty quick. Axel Petit just put in the time there as well. He was running in the top five for much of the race, battling it out with uh, Jardier, uh, one of our YouTube streamers. Although I think with, when it comes to Jardier, I think he crosses the line between an eSport competitor and a, a streamer because he's so fast. Uh, also, the world's happiest man. I think uh, one of his parents must have been uh, a Lego man uh, because he just constantly has a smile on his face no matter no matter what's going on with him. So uh, I imagine he is uh, smiling from ear to ear on his stream right now. In fact, I might tune in to find out. It's uh, Jesse, is there anyone from the last race that you think uh, perhaps has a point to prove or uh, is just uh, here to continue on their form? Well, that's a very loaded question, Chris. Well, but, it was, it very much was, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you for putting me on the spot in qualifying. But yeah, I think a lot of the uh sort of youtuber or uh, influencer drivers have a bit to prove i don't think that jardier who is currently second in this qualifying uh session is one of those but i think a lot of those guys weren't necessarily on the pace and you certainly wouldn't expect them to be but silverstone's one of those tracks that they're they're sort of like a a happy medium between some of these guys and i think you're going to see that here as qualifying continues but if it was anybody it would be them because they were the ones that were sort of languishing a little bit in that race on pace so if i had to pick anybody it would be them george do you uh, have any insight on that uh i really i really don't have too much insight on that i'm <laughs> i'm here to pretty much observe the masters of the rain come out. I mean, it's not really pouring conditions at this point. It's a bit of a light drizzle uh, from what we can experience as spectators here. But I feel like it just adds such a different element into the racing conditions that you could throw these same drivers into a dry conditioned race uh, and have a completely different uh, race come out of it because of the conditions that we're going to go into. So. I mean, the race, is it guaranteed that we're going to have rain there? Or is, is it potential that we're going to have a dry conditioning or dry conditions for the race? I'll let you feel that one, Simon. I'm oh, sorry. I'm um, miles away then. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so, the <laughs> so, yes, it is, it's going to be fixed. So we've got a uh, 21 degrees ambient temperatures, 26 degrees track. And we're looking at 20% rain and 20% wet. So it's going to be fixed weather for the duration of the qualifying and the race. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we won't be having any sort of um, thunderstorms and that like we had last night. <laughs> so, now, yeah. some viewers may be seeing that as a negative. If you're new to, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the Seto Corsa Competizione, you may think, oh, wouldn't it be better if we were emulating real life? And 
uh, where there's much more variability perhaps but it's quite easy to overdo the variability when you're setting up a server and it's very easy to accidentally tiptoe into what i could only describe as biblical weather conditions which we've seen uh, at a few events uh, recently and the problem with that isn't necessarily that the drivers aren't capable of doing it it's just that it makes for really bad racing for 90 minutes watching people driving around 15 20 seconds off the pace struggling to keep the car on the island it's no good for the viewer it's no good for me as a commentator and the drivers hate it as well so having a slight slightly less variability in the the racing conditions i think is is better for everyone besides we've got a typical british summer day here i can say that and, uh, and not get yelled at because it's accurate i've spent most of my life going to silverstone on days like this so it looks very familiar to me it very much feels like home going back to jesse's uh jesse's point uh where i sort of dropped him in it a little bit earlier someone that i think has a point to prove this time out is uh one of rlm's guys james parker who uh was running in the had the top three for part of the race had a little bit of an incident dropped out to the edge of the top five and then had got caught up in another bit of bit of trouble as we're watching james parker in the beautiful mclaren 720s I think he's got he's got some work to do to a point to prove he's definitely got the pace uh, but uh, it's one thing being quick overlap and another keeping it all together and incident free for 90 minutes that's one of the things we saw at Kyle Army is that the pace at the front was so metronomic and relentless that tiny tiny errors would cost three or four places it was uh, extremely extremely tense at the front Jesse I think we lost Jesse we may have lost Jesse there. Sorry, pick no, it up. No, no. no I, I'm, I'm here, but uh, George, I'll let you take that one as uh, I'm dealing with a bit of background noise. So George, please take that. I don't know. I just uh, wanted to say, uh, through to Chris's side, um, when it comes down to these conditions now, uh, I mean, when, when it is kind of drizzling like this at Silverstone, would they still be running out on uh, slick tires or would they be electing to, to go to wets at this point? I mean, would it's, they get too yeah, hot? It's an, inter it's an it's... interesting question, actually, because the lap times are very quick, uh, which leads me to believe that they're potentially on slicks. It's difficult to tell looking at a game based on reflections on the track surface. And so much of that is down to what graphics settings that, that they're running as, as to how wet it actually is. So uh, it's just one of the, the slight uh, weirdnesses that come in when you're watching a virtual race rather than a real race. We have a great... Uh, understanding of how wet something is by looking at it in real life, but a simulation of it, maybe not so much. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Simon, this could be slick territory. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're definitely going to be running in slicks today. Um, it's, it's not going to be wet enough to run uh, with wet tyres. So, yeah, we can, as, as I want to do, when I pan down through the uh, the pitch tray, I will have a look and see if we can see some of the tyres that the guys are running before the race. And if they're, basically, if they've got Pirelli on the side, then it means they've got slicks on. If it hasn't, if it's just playing black, then we know they're um, running wet tyres. Um, but to be honest... Some, uh, some great intel there. Thank that's you. it, yeah. So, um, yeah, so what I'll do is when we get to that point, like I said, I will just pan down through and hopefully we try and capture, see who's on what. Um, well, we've obviously got five minutes between the qualifying and the race there. To, we are watching Alex Buncombe, one of the real-world racing drivers, uh, driving his uh, real-world car. He took the 108 Bentley for last season, along with uh, Andy Suchek as well, who've got in this race. So great to see the uh, two Bentley uh, factory drivers, both Team M Sport drivers as well, taking part in this race and looking to see what they can do. Uh, he put in a reasonable time during practice, looking a little bit off the pace at the moment, so a little bit more time to find. But uh, it'd be interesting to see how these guys do, well, throughout the race. As we saw last time, uh, and Jesse can definitely speak to this one, a lot of the real-world drivers perhaps started a little bit slow, uh, and as mm. they got, uh, got into the race, uh, went a little bit quicker. But speaking of which, I'm going to interrupt myself and that train of thought there. We do have a real-world driver at the top of the time uh, list, Matteo Caroli, who is a real-world Porsche Cup driver driving the, uh, the Porsche GTR there. Uh, very quickly indeed. In fact, down into the uh, the two oh ones now. The times at the top of the sheet. Uh, very fast pace. Yeah, absolutely good stuff here by Matteo right now. Twenty three year old Italian driver, and it's he's getting down. He's down in the two oh ones, and you guys have talked about this all practice sessions so far. That these guys are are, are quick enough that it's likely they're likely still on soft tires it's not quite wet enough and 
I mean, the times are sort of reflecting that. The, the weather is just a mild uh, annoyance on the windscreen right now. I mean, other than that, these guys are still going really quickly. And from what I've seen so far, none of these guys are struggling for uh, grip at this point that you could say was weather related. So it's all looking really good so far. Yeah, uh, uh, wet weather obviously being a great leveler. We are losing three seconds a lap worth of grip. So while we're not seeing uh, huge accidents as we watch uh, Zahir Essa, who uh, uh, George referred to earlier, the Formula V driver, the South African, uh, looking very quick up the front of the pack. I think he was in the top two in practice, so potentially a little bit more time to find there. We're not looking at it being monsoon conditions, but we are seeing lap times maybe three or four seconds off the ultimate pace for these guys at Silverstone. So there is a, a grip difference. And I imagine over the course of, of a race in these kind of conditions, we're going to see probably a few more little mistakes creeping in as, uh, as people are pushing very hard right on the edge of the limit. What do you think, George? Yeah, I, I think you're, you've nailed it there. I think where the, the nuances come in in these kind of conditions are, are really on the amounts of, of, of track limits that you can push over onto the curbing side because those are the surfaces that really uh, kind of get slicked up. You can't put the power down on you know the, uh, the limits as much. I mean, you still got the grip on the actual asphalt, uh, and I think maybe that's where they would be losing a little bit of their time here, just not wanting to uh, lose it over the curbing side of things. I think well, that's it's interesting you should say that. We've been watching Elvin Smith on the, the mainstream, and as you were saying that, just a couple of instances where he has been cutting, uh, cutting onto the curbing as you would do on the normal racing line. That McLaren 720S just looking a little bit twitchy. Uh, it's fine through Maggots and Beckett's at the moment, though, looking pretty calm. But then again, he is, uh, he is in traffic, so perhaps not pushing quite as hard. But as we came, uh, saw him come down onto the old start, finish straight, the right-hand kink there, going across the curbing, caused the back end to step out and through uh, the Luffield complex before it. So it's, uh, it's not the worst conditions in the world, but I think it's just enough to keep everyone honest. Yeah, yeah keep I them on their toes, I say. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Simon. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, just, yeah, the weather's basically to keep everyone on their toes, really, isn't it? So, you know, it's just a, that sort of fine line between, you know, you know, getting an absolutely soaking wet track to, you know, what we've got at the moment. It's uh, pretty true. But, yeah, that's a qualifying just finished there, guys. I just wanted to quickly just let you know that we have actually up to the top. It was the top 18, I saw a minute ago. It looks like the changes have changed. Yeah, so almost up to the top 18 was literally one second within the pace. So, some pretty awesome times to see there. But, um, yeah, back over to you there, Chris. Yeah, I mean, most of the top 20 within a second is uh, is pretty good going. Uh, just so everyone understands, uh, as we see some of the sim racers uh, squeak in right at the top of the list there, if you're looking at the broadcast tower on the left-hand side of your screen at the moment, they are color-coded. The guys with a red background to their number are our sim racers. The guys with a white background are our real-world racing drivers. As you can see, the esports guys are doing very well at the moment. And the guys with a silver background are influencers. So uh, top of the influencer battle at the moment is Jardier, who everyone knows and loves, I'm sure. Top of the esports drivers is Strethlow at the moment. Edging out Danilo Santoro, who perhaps had the uh, advantage at Kyle Army. But we do have in the top three, Matteo Caroli of the real world drivers. So yeah, a bit more mixed up. And certainly uh, another thing that's a bit more mixed up than last time out is the car choice, where we're not seeing a clear winner at the moment, I don't think. Yeah, at Kyle Army, you kind of were just dominated by Porsches and Audis, right? Yeah, <laughs> there, much, there yeah. is a little bit more of a uh, mixture in manufacturers, which is always nicer to see on the grid, especially with so many cars lined up. Always nice to see some variety. Yeah, uh, I'm a particular fan of McLaren, as most people know. The top of McLaren at the moment um, is uh, Ibrahimi uh, Samir from Redline Motorsport. Um, who else is driving that? Oh, I think Jimmy... Uh, Jimmy as well. Jimmy P was also driving the McLaren. We've got Bentleys, we've got Porsches, we've got a couple of Ferraris in the top 20 as well, uh, as well as the ever-present Audis, AMGs and, and Porsches. So yeah, not a bad representation and uh, certainly looks a bit more like a, a real Blanc pan round uh, at the sharp end than, uh, than it has done in the past, which I think is starting to uh, suggest that maybe the BOP is a little bit more open now. Yeah, that's always a balancing a balancing point for the devs and, and trying to manage things there because uh, as gamers do, gamers will always try and uh, find whatever's the fastest round and suddenly you lose that, that beautiful mixture of cars because people will just want to chase the quickest lap times. 
Well, and the wet weather certainly helps that as well. Edgy cars like the you know, that may be fast in, in all sorts of conditions, like the Porsche and the Audi, become a little bit more challenging, and particularly in very heavy wet weather. We know that the Ferrari goes well. We know that the Bentley goes well. Um, traditionally, more slightly more stable cars that aren't quite so uh, difficult on the limit, and we're certainly seeing that reflected in the time. So it's uh, it's great. Not too many people electing to take the Lamborghini, though. I see. <laughs> Uh, is it well, just uh, Mr. Coman in, in 41st place, uh, I think? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a very risky a risky choice to do if you do go with a, a Lamborghini, especially in the slight damp. I mean, in the dry, it just it's twitchy, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In these kind of conditions, it's it's just uh, it's not for me. Certainly, uh, it takes a brave man to uh, to pilot that particular vehicle uh, in the wet. Certainly. I did a, a race at Spa in the wet uh, a few a few months ago, and uh, I'm still sort of uh, coming down with the shakes from that one. I think so, <laughs> dodging all the puddles. <laughs> so uh, we are about four minutes away from the beginning of the formation lap. We have a five minute turnover period just to give the drivers a chance to have a break uh, before the race, get themselves set up, and to give the uh, the race directors time to do their job. So uh, we're just going to give you a bit of a rundown and talk through some of the guys in the field. Uh, who was on pole? That's the real question. It was uh, Strathlow on pole. We haven't seen a lot of him uh, over the course of the weekend. The number 69 car. So I don't know if anyone wants to bring up his uh, his little fact file and give us a bit of background. But Daniel Santoro in sure. second place from John Lacey Esport uh, was someone we saw a lot of in Kyle Army and present throughout the race. Jesse? No, absolutely. Steve Strello, incredibly quick driver, runs an RLM's Tier 1 series, and he finished second in the championship that just wrapped up a week or so ago. So he's an incredibly quick driver that can hang with the best of them, including eSports stars. He's got a bunch of wins and everything. So him being at the sharp end of the field doesn't really surprise me too much. And another driver who's appearance at the top of the field doesn't surprise me santoro in second place interesting that we're having british weather at a british track and the front row of the grid are british cars but uh, to santoro uh he uh he won last night's 90 minute warm-up race and as you mentioned chris incredibly quick all things considered and he's showing it here today he was quite far down the list and uh, right at the end of qualifying put on a show there for us yeah we've also got chris hokey in fourth who's another rlm guy uh samir uh in in fifth place as well also a, an rlm driver so uh good representation of the rlm guys at the sharp end of the grid uh, i think chris hoker was particularly uh, in a, a good position to win at kyle army and uh just wasn't able to seize on the opportunity came very close though certainly had the pace to do so it'd be interesting to see what he can do today uh, further down the field, we have Axel Petit, who uh, is a fixture of Assetto Corsa Competizione uh, eSport events. Uh, James Parker, starting in ninth place, perhaps not quite getting the pace that he'd like and, and expect to see a little bit further up. Uh, he's joined by Jardier on the fifth row. Uh, going further down, uh, we have the likes of uh, uh, Darren King down in 20th place. So you would expect him to be a little bit higher. He was running in the, the top 10 for most of the, the previous event. And, uh, and Vicky as well, the uh, RLM driver down in 22nd place. Uh, is there any, I, I can't see the, uh, the bottom half of the, uh, the control yeah. tower at the moment. So is, is there anyone of note that's perhaps underperformed, Simon, if you can see that? Um, I'm just, uh, just doing the, uh, the pan down through the, um, the pitch straight at the moment, going through the guys on the stream here. So I'm, I'm just looking at all the tires as well. So we can see that everyone is running slicks at the moment. So I said, they see Pirelli on the tire wall. You know they're running slicks. If it is plain black, you know they've got wets on. But so far, well, they're nearly going as quick as uh, in the wet as. I so <laughs> I think they're. Uh, it's definitely dry conditions. Absolutely. I'm joining yeah. you with that. I'm. I, I look at these lap times, and I say this to Simon every time I I commentate alongside him. Uh, they make me want to throw my my sim racing stuff out the window because I just can't compete. Their wet wettish times are what I would aim for in the dry. Uh, I would be happy with them. So yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, um, it's always great to watch talented drivers out on the grid. And uh, yeah, these guys are going to be so close together. I'm so excited for the start here. 
I've had the privilege of watching a lot of the uh, ACC esports guys uh, live. Doing a, did a did a video with Jimmy Parker uh, at the tail end of last year. Uh, he came over to my place and did some driving, and, and we recorded some stuff. And he also watched me drive. So I've also had uh, an esports guy use the phrase, "Why the hell are you doing that?" several times during the space of an app while I, uh, <laughs> while I fly my train set to Corsa Competizione. And that is why he's a second and a half lap quicker than I am. So. <laughs> And has the spare capacity to uh, point out where I'm going wrong at the same time. So, uh, yeah, fast guys. Yeah, so two seconds and we're about to start the full formation lap. So uh, we have uh, 90 minutes of Silverstone just about to get started as the cars pull away from the old pit box. Uh, it's the only part of Silverstone that can contain enough cars is the, the old pit lane, the new F1 pit lane that they built only has uh, i think it's 24 garages or 28 garages or something so they use the old of uh, what they're now called endurance pits because the pit boxes are much smaller so they can get a lot more of them in which allows us to have a much bigger field which is uh, very nice indeed that does mean that in the early part of the lap while the tires are cold and brakes are cold and you're still fighting it out with the people you start alongside you've got to contend with maggots and beckett's this series of sweeping corners that the cars are just about to start coming through now on your screen so always a bit cagey in the first few corners at silverstone uh would you agree jesse a bit cagey in the first few laps of the drive or the few first few corners of the drivers cagey for me in the booth i'm rocking back and forth i can't wait for the start of this race this is incredible it's incredible that we're getting to do this again but to your point chris 110 percent you want a good start you want to get away clean you want to do everything right but the problem with that is there's 40 plus other cars who also want to do that and they also want to have the best possible start throw in a little bit of spitting rain a little british weather as you guys call it and you have yourself a race at silverstone so it's all about not making the silly mistakes in the first couple of corners and if you get to maggots and beckett's and your single file that's golden at that point would you agree george Yes, I think that if you can just keep things neat and tidy at the start, that's where you set yourself up for uh, potentially a great finish. If you bin it in the first couple of corners, it's really much uh, over. If you get damaged early on, you have to go into the pits. Uh, you may as well say goodbye to those uh, top five finishers, uh, unless you're extremely quick. But in a field like this with drivers here, I don't think that anyone throwing it off in the in the early stages of the game and picking up damage are going to be winning the, the race so to really finish you have to start cleanly like you've said and just look how many cars we've got on this grid uh, it's absolutely insane to me as a sim racing fan to just uh, stare down and see so many cars lined up uh, in a shot like this just coming down in front of us weaving trying to keep the warmth in their tires trying to get uh you know the best possible start that they can uh, it all comes down to how you want to start the race so back over to you chris yeah we are watching steve strello uh, as uh, jesse mentioned earlier the german driver uh finished second in season two of the tier one championship for rlm last year a quick guy uh, and uh, obviously starting from the best possible position in the ever popular Aston Martin Vantage. I should say ever popular, the new one's ever popular. The old one was a bit situation dependent down to the fact that it didn't really do anything with underbody aerodynamics, which at a place like Silverstone is, uh, is quite useful to have. Uh, but we are looking now as they come down the hangar straight, uh, gonna be going through, <sighs> they're not going through the hangar straight at all. I'm uh, thinking that this is the old Silverstone layout. They're coming down towards Brooklands and Luffield to round out the end of the lap. I've already forgotten how that Silverstone was rebuilt 10 years ago. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, typical British beach weather, a field led by two British cars, as Jesse mentioned. And I think we've got a race on, boys. Absolutely, yeah. So just literally coming around the final corner now. And uh, yeah, as soon as we come to the start finish line and the lights go green, it will be go, go, go. So yeah, let's we all hope a for a clean one. From, we saw a great start from Danilo Santoro last time, who is not giving up anything. <laughs> Steve Strello on the front uh, row of the grid there. Not going to give up a single meter of room. So this could be a very exciting start. Going around the outside into uh, into Cop's corner is always a tricky proposition, but it almost looks like he's ahead at the beginning. Just behind us, they're coming down towards, just waiting for the green flag. 
We're watching Samir Ibrahimi for a red line motorsport. Red He's dropped back a little bit. We have the green flag, and it looks like for now Strello's got the better start. But as they go up into second gear, Santoro does well. Santoro round the outside, getting better traction, but has a huge snap of oversteer. Somehow manages to keep his foot in. They're going to be going side by side into maggots. This is absolutely not what anyone really wanted. They wanted a nice single file run, as Jesse mentioned. And now we've got Chris Hogan going round the outside. Matteo Caroli as well. Uh, Santoro got a great start, but has ended up dropping back down to third position after all of that. Caroli, the winner there. Absolutely. We, just... have a, we have a bit of a Kimi Raikkonen style incident in the background as the car going into the wall at Hangar Straight just before the corner. Everything looking a, uh, a bit dicey as we're seeing Santoro start to come back at uh, Caroli. This is uh, far from done, this battle. Just to uh, make you guys aware, towards the back of the field, just a massive incident down the hangar straight. Uh, huge amounts of the field involved. I'm not quite sure how many cars were impacted, but quite a few cars making contact, unfortunately there, not able to avoid it. And uh, I feel like big incident coming out towards uh, the back of the here, field. The uh, stewards will certainly be busy for yes. that. While you were talking, okay. we saw... Uh, I just want to jump in there quickly is uh, Ryan's just told me it's going to be a restart so we are going to do a quick restart to the race I thought T1 as we had from the camera then was looking really good so it looks like we're going to have to do a restart nobody slowed down is what he's just mentioning so hopefully he might give us a bit more information there but yes looks like we're going to go for a full restart as we said there's been quite about 15 cars involved after T1 which is a shame to see because as we saw from T1 a minute ago it was pretty clean going through so yeah the the race there from the leaders was was fantastic but uh uh, obviously further back there was an incident we didn't see on camera maybe we can get a replay of that not sure we've just had a restart so uh we'll be uh is there any way we can skip the re uh the uh the start time or do we uh do we have to sit through that Simon? i'm not too sure because it's probably one of the first times we actually had to do a restart because generally our races are pretty clean <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're getting all these real world drivers involved <laughs> this is it yeah i mean to all this i mean they had the charity event in they last week um the SRO charity event and obviously uh, through their test races they've um, had a few uh, problems with that but yeah hopefully we'll see if we can uh, forward on after this but I don't think we can actually forward on because we're actually on the race session so I think the only command we have is I said when you forward on would be the end of session which we don't want. <laughs> okay well so, no yeah. problem I think there was plenty to dissect there. Uh, as I was saying, just uh, just as uh, Ryan was updating us on the, uh, sorry, as George was updating us on the uh, incident that was happening further back in the pack, uh, we saw Jardier uh, get unceremoniously punted down into club corner. We had uh, a fantastic battle between Steve Strello, Daniel Santoro, and uh, Matteo Caroli at the front. Chris Hoker not quite getting involved in that. We saw the leads change. We saw second and third place swap. We saw the cars side by side for most of the lap. That was, uh, it was a pretty exciting watch at the front, Jesse. Uh, what did you make of all of it? Well, when I, when I saw and after I had said that if you got single file going through maggots and beckets that you had it made, what did the two leaders do, Chris? They decided, I'm not backing down to you. I want this position. And they go two by two through that corner and they make it away cleanly and it is unfortunate to have to to do a restart but here at rlm we are all about having the best possible race and having a clean race so at the end of the day in the interest of the people that were uh, you know had a bit of a rough first couple of corners we've decided to restart the race in hopes of a better start because that's not fair to them and it's not fair to you guys at home watching so just be fantastic we know all this means chris is that we're going to get to see it again <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully better the second time round. so to speak to uh, to george's point earlier about avoiding the curbs in the wet that turn one overtake round the outside of uh of santoro went round the outside of steve strello uh strello got up on the curb and, and had to back out of the power you could see the car squirm around and he gained a full car length around the outside which was instrumental in, in in that move around the outside so yeah hopefully uh a lot to be learned from some of these drivers for the second attempt and uh i'm looking forward to it 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, we've got to stick this round for another two more minutes before the actual uh, the formation lap starts again. But um, yeah, I mean, it was the best the best idea because I said we've got plenty of uh, live stewards watching. Um, obviously, we didn't actually catch the incidents. Obviously, we were actually catching a lot of the uh, the overtakes at that time. So that's why you guys don't understand why we were doing a restart. But there was about a 15 car pile up after T1, which is such a shame, really. I would have thought everyone would got through the S's without any uh, incidents. But unfortunately, I think a couple of people hit the curbs. And it just sort of caused a chain reaction um, at the back of the field. So, yeah, that's the reason why we've gone for the uh, the restart. So, yeah, back to you, Chris. Was the incident on um, uh, Hangar Straight just out of interest? Yeah. I think we saw, we saw, I, I was, we saw one. I was, we? I, I, was, um, I was kind of just watching towards the back of the pack to just see where the battles were going. And, um, yeah, I just saw cars going sideways. I think what had happened was just... I mean, they were side by side. One little tap, you get sent off onto the side. It's wet grass, uh, wet conditions. You get bounced off, sent back into the middle of the pack. Uh, it's very difficult for anyone to slow down. And well, everyone. That's very, very um, interesting that you say that, George. Because it's we it's just a exactly dangerous place for things to happen. Exactly the same incident, uh, type of incident, both as things happened at the Blancpain endurance round at Silverstone in 2019. Uh, we had a car that, that went off. I can't remember if it was Wellington Straight or Hangar Straight now, uh, but uh, she went off the side and then came back across the track, collecting multiple other cars. Uh, requiring so it's a, exactly a, what a happened there. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we've seen it before. I mentioned at the time it looked like someone was doing a Raikkonen uh, in the background in the Formula One a few years ago where he went off at the edge of the Wellington Straight onto the grass, kept his foot in and uh, lost it coming back across the straight and collected another couple of cars with him. So uh, we can wildly speculate about what happened there, but uh, it's been consigned to history. And uh, thankfully, one of the upsides of uh, esports as opposed to real world motorsport is that uh, we can talk for three or four minutes. Everyone gets set back up and we're ready to go for another formation lap. George, yeah, absolutely. When, you're, when you're driving, uh, what do you do to prepare the car on a formation lap like this? Um, I mean, I generally just go and... Um set my fuel mapping to the absolute easiest so like in the porsche i would just go to nine or ten uh just kind of uh i don't find that weaving really gets too much done in the car when i'm out on my formation app i find that just dragging the brakes is is more efficient in in building up temperature in, in the uh in the tires there's no point in sort of uh, speeding up and just slamming on the brakes to slow down so to me these uh these warm-up laps really uh kind of just focused on 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 kind of just uh keeping my distance and just thinking about what's coming up ahead you know there's not really too much need to try and, and weave and stuff especially in the wet here i find that just dragging it in in acc does the trick really yes i, I totally agree with that I, I found very little advantage to weaving that being said uh you mentioned uh, keeping a bit of distance to the car in front that is something that is uh I think more critical in this kind of game online because you get so many people trying to warm the brakes uh, as you do perhaps more in the formula one than in, in gt racing where you've got a really short formation lap uh you get a lot of very heavy braking to try and warm the brakes and it's so easy to uh to make a mistake and speaking of mistakes it looks like matteo caroli hasn't made the grid and uh will be forced to start from the pit lane that's that's a real problem for him because oh. that's uh one of the people we were talking about potentially having the uh, equipment to win this race unceremoniously taken out i'm not sure if he failed to press drive in time or he's had a disconnection issue maybe uh maybe uh simon can let us know when he knows yeah i'm, I'm just uh... the fact he hasn't jumped in probably means that he doesn't yet know what's happened but uh, that's a real blow but we've still got steve strello and uh, daniel santoro on the front of the grid with the two rlm guys behind and that will be a very tasty battle down into the first turn stoke corner jesse yeah basically all we get here is a second chance to see strello and santoro race each other like they were before and if they can get away cleanly again they've learned a thing or two about each other i would say from this point of you know what can and can't i do and if uh, i believe that was santoro that hit the curb and went a bit wide because of it and gathered it all back in and maybe he doesn't go quite that far out this time maybe he presses <laughs> strello a little more i love the gamesmanship of racing i love it 
and we're going to see some more of that here. And again, this is just like a treat. Now we get to do another start and see that all over again and uh, could be a completely different outcome, Chris. Yeah, uh, it was Santoro that had a, uh, a brown trousers moment on the outside curve of Stowe. It was... Um, he pushed very, very hard right onto the curving on the outside to keep the place. Neither driver uh, gave any quarter, which was exactly what you would expect, particularly on turn one. So uh, neither driver gives in. Someone has to use that extra width on the outside, and he had a huge snap of oversteer. So I think the inevitable happened there, but he managed to keep his foot in, uh, keep the pace and keep the position, which is incredible when you think about it. We're watching Zahir Essa, the uh, South African driver, and now the leader of the pro driver category as uh, the next down the next down the line is Alex Bunkham uh, in 25th place the uh, Bentley factory driver unfortunately with uh, Matteo being uh, stuck in the pits for whatever reason we've uh, been robbed a little bit of that but as I've been wittering on we've uh, we've got around the lap quite quickly there I don't know if that's a quicker warm-up lap or I've just been talking more <laughs> Jesse <laughs> I'm unsure either way, but uh, it's fantastic to hear your voice, Chris. And uh, also, yeah, it, it is unfortunate to, of what's happening. But man, Isa is up there. And I got to talk about these pro drivers. They have something to prove here today, too. They have to prove or they, they have the opportunity to prove that, hey, we can keep up with these fast esports drivers because we're real drivers. OK, so here we go for the second restart. Once again, Strello and Santoro side by side Santoro perhaps half a meter back compared to last time but he got the slightly better start what happens now it was second gear last time or the next gear up I should say but it's actually Chris Hoka making the room Santoro tries to run around the outside goes onto the curb again this time doesn't get the snap over Steve he's finding himself having to fight off Chris Hoka who's going to try and run around the outside into maggots and looking like he's going to they make contact luck is somehow both managed to keep the car pointing in the right direction Hoka takes the place but that was uh well, I'm not sure. It looked like a bit of a lean from Hoka, and it looked like Santoro not give any quarter at all. But uh, great move from the RLM motorsport driver one way or the other there, Jesse. Yeah, a bit of argy-bargy, a little bit of elbows out. But my goodness, they both saved it, and they continue. Though the positions are reversed, those still are your top three. Just incredible driving. We saw some really great saves last night, and we've already seen one here as everyone chases everybody down this straight. This is fantastic racing that we're seeing so far. And if I'm not very much mistaken... Chris, yeah, Chris, Ho Chris Hoke has continued to hang on to that second place. That is very impressive as we pan down the grid coming through some of the tighter corners. You see it's just oh, an absolute back log wow. jam. <laughs> yeah, coming back into the international pits now, just looking at the the multi-car three-wide stuff there as we're looking at Chris Hoke is now coming under pressure from his RLM teammate, Sabir, uh, doing uh, an excellent job there in the McLaren 720S. But the real winner from all of that turn one uh, to turn three fighting is Steve Strello, who seems to have uh, just running away a little bit at the front with a second and a half lead, which I think is about the maximum lead we saw for the first uh, 45 minutes or so of the Kyle Army race. So he's got uh, everything uh, exactly where he wanted. Yeah, that start looked a lot cleaner, a little bump in the front, obviously, but it looked a lot better and uh, not hearing anything about that, about anything else. So that looks like the restart or the original start that we were looking for as all these drivers are away, mostly unscathed. And now you have to find your rhythm and you have to settle in because it's an hour and a half in these mixed conditions. Of course, as we uh, said in the pre-race, most of these drivers, if not all of these drivers, still on the soft compound of tire, rain or wet tires, as they are called, absolutely not optimum here. You see the rain on your screen spitting down in the windshield or windscreen wipers going, obviously, but just a mild annoyance more than anything else. But as we saw with Santoro on that initial start again, the curbs could be slippery still, Chris. Uh, yeah, speaking of a mild annoyance, look at Zahir Essa doing an excellent job of hounding Axel Petit. Uh, the, again, the top real world racing drivers made up a couple of places at the start, as we saw from the uh, from the Kyle Army round, the race of real world drivers just launching off the line incredibly well and knowing how to fight as you would expect early on. Uh, looking like he's got a lot of pace and uh, Axel Petit there, a seasoned ACC esports veteran at this stage, has uh, quite a lot to think about. Uh, George, looks like you might be uh, getting your way here and uh, getting some good battling from Zahir. 
Yeah, so here is uh, doing the uh, South African flag, a, a very proud moment there as he hassles the back of Petit, being forced to um, really get on the defensive. We now going to follow along uh, Pintos in position 25. I mean, if you just look at the cars in front and the cars behind, Tommy Pintos here just has a, uh, just a train in front, a train behind. Uh, there's not a car's length between any car anywhere and up in front of him. Drivers will be making there's not a car's moves. width, let alone a length. No, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, 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 I mean, and it's just evolving and changing permanently. And every time that a driver battles out in front, uh, the potential for you to slide in and make up a uh, a move is there. As we see Chakanov go a little bit wide off the exit there onto the grass, manages to keep it you know, neat and tidy, doesn't throw it away, but will have picked up a bit of dirt onto those tires. We see him getting late onto the brakes as he tries to find a way past into position 30. And, uh, oh, he's made a big mistake, spins the car around, and now needs to rejoin the circuit safely, but will be losing out there as we now look at is that Panka in the uh, position That's uh, Gergo Panka, the Kunos uh, livery editor. So a lot of the real world liveries you've seen here, uh, this man is responsible for. But uh, the fight we were watching there was very much the, uh, all the real world guys have got together and decided to have their own little battle. Uh, I wonder if uh, that incident we saw just had a little bit of contact. It was very weird to see a driver uh, snap over steer in that particular direction. So perhaps just a tiny bit of contact that we couldn't see from that particular camera angle but that battle from sort of about 18th place down where um, Alex Buncom is in, in the Bentley uh, in fact probably a couple of positions back from P20 to P30 separated by a few seconds and uh, very little in the way of real track space so um, and that battle in front uh, from James Parker back and we're looking at sort of Elvin Smith now did really well in the Kyle Army race a uh, little bit of work to do here for, for THR doing a, uh, a reasonable job in 11th, uh, following Jimmy Parker, who we've talked about extensively, and Matushka as well. So they're all separated by you know a few tenths of a second. And uh, Elvin Smith actually goes for a pretty late pass down the inside into, uh, into the loop. Uh, excellent piece of overtaking there. That was uh, opportunistic and perfectly executed. That's just incredible. Elvin Smith just threw that McLaren in there and said, I'm going to sit this on the apex. I'm going to apex and I'm going to have that spot. Thank you very much. This is incredible stuff for a top 10 pass. And as you saw on the bottom of the screen, a couple of penalties. And now's the first time we get to hear from our steward in the box, Ryan. Uh, yes, just to update you, car 255, Diamato has been given a drive-through penalty for dangerous driving. He's had multiple dive bombs and contacts on the first opening laps, so he has been given a drive-through penalty for dangerous standards. Um, as for Crisoni in the number 11 Ferrari, we believe that is down to speeding in the pit lane. Yeah, that looks like a... Uh, that's a... It a penalty that's been issued by the game isn't it the stop and go 20 seconds so that is likely for pit lane speeding so doubling up on his uh, his woes there uh, after being stuck in the pits for the restart and then uh, by looks of things speeding in the pit lane potentially uh, a little bit of frustration keeping in or, or maybe even just unfamiliarity with the game either way he'd be pretty unhappy about that i would wager we were just watching um I can't remember who we were watching because my brain has turned into mush. So Matt, Samuel, Matt Samuels. <laughs> it was. Well, watching Matt Samuel. Thank you so much. I'm glad someone's paying attention. Uh, well, I'm sure everyone was except for me. Anyway, uh, besides my uh, baby brain induced uh, little uh, moment I just had there, we were watching Matt Samuel, who's a British drift champion, took part in the last event, could, uh, did a really good job actually, surprisingly, given that this isn't really his discipline great wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing throughout and seems to be uh, hassling the uh, Bentley factory driver of Andy Suchek as well so uh, taking the fight to the uh, to the Bentley boys today a oh, great little uh, battle kind of brewing there for the real life drivers like you said um, it seems like we've kind of split it up we see a lot of the uh, esports guys up at the top here we see position 17 just here fighting for Position 16 with Portia up in front. And I mean, this this is just what you, you love to see. Is just there's there's no space whatsoever. Gonna go try and look down the inside. Not gonna be anywhere, but just trying to narrow down the gap between the cars 
in front. And just here, just doing a great job to hold on to the back of Portia. And it's all about just keeping that rhythm and waiting for someone else to make that tiny little mistake, break too early, break too late, uh, or just use some of the slip as they go side by side. Now, the Porsche, it looks like they're going to just uh, get let past there. I don't think wants to have the rear view mirror full of that Porsche and going to get let through quite safely there. They are uh, both uh, teammates at Racing Line Motorsport, so it makes sense. And it looked like... Um it looked like he had a lot more pace. Uh, the point, that, you know, the fact that he was putting uh, nose up the inside every every other corner sort of su uh, suggested as much. We're on board with Martinez, who's uh, hassling the Bentley of Torvenen in front. Uh, both esports professionals are, are, are long time. Both Bentleys alongside each other. Can he outbreak down into Stowe? Not this time. Uh, Bentley's looking, uh, looking pretty good in these conditions still. Perhaps not got the rub of the BOP at the moment in the game build. It was certainly one of the quicker cars earlier on in the history of the game, but these things evolve uh, as, as updates come out. But uh, I think the Bentley looking very stable at the moment. And uh, over the course of a race, that might not be the worst thing to have, Jesse. Yeah, part of me is wondering as we see a car that goes slightly off there and a little bit of a touch here, but no harm, no foul, really, as they all just continue on. That's uh, been a been a bunch of, uh, or a few, I should say, shoves that don't really amount to anything. It's more of a, I'm here, but uh, back to the previous point about the Bentleys. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting choice. We didn't know exactly what we were going to get, but perhaps with these big, bad Bentleys, the rain that maybe they can carry the curbs a little bit more than some of the other uh cars or something because i've certainly seen in these conditions i've certainly seen the bentleys use the curbs and use it to good effect mind you i mean it's just there as i uh, that was Look perfect that timing Martin around the outside that's an extraordinary bit of traction around the outside there can he out drag uh nest of a thing down into uh down the hangar straight uh, it looks like it's a foregone conclusion. May even have to go defensive against the other Aston Martin. And that highlights one of the problems with the Bentley at the moment is uh, some of the other cars just a bit better on the traction stakes and certainly a little bit better in top speed uh, once all of the aerodynamics are trimmed out. But that being said, uh, still doing a great job. And I was just looking at Alex Buncan, the uh, real world team Parker racing driver, uh, sorry, Bentley Team M Sport driver, uh, running up in 18th place. I think he qualified uh, well outside of the top 20, but has made up a huge amount of places on the open lap as we go back to Essa again, looking like uh, getting past Petit is more of a question of when rather than if. Yeah, it certainly could be that. And Chris, we saw this two weeks ago at Kialami, didn't we? Where maybe some of the fast esports gentlemen and ladies were a bit quicker in qualifying but as the race goes on and you get into a nice natural rhythm some of these real world drivers who probably have a lot of experience obviously fighting with traffic and being consistent and all these things that make a good racing driver you see them come through the field and alex buncombe is exactly doing that as you said qualified down the order he's inside the top 20 now and I, I i don't think he's done he's coming for more so that's fantastic to see and it's a little confirmation from what we saw at kialami as well yeah we actually saw axel Petit make a mistake breaking down into club corner as well uh, but unfortunately yes it wasn't really in the best position to uh, capitalize on it and uh, hasn't really done him too much good but it shows that axel Petit is perhaps feeling the pressure uh, as many of these cars, <laughs> many of these guys are, as the, uh, you see the camera pan through to various battles going on throughout the field. We've got Alec Ensign as well, um, fast guy. Uh, see uh, a lot of him at the moment in ACC doing a great job of uh, looks like he's hassling Matt Samuel, who we were talking about earlier, the uh, British drift champion, uh, who's for, uh, sort of traded in his Nissan 300. Uh, SX for uh, something with a bit more uh, rear grips. He tries to run around the outside of Brown in that fairly loud looking Bentley. Yeah, it looks like Brown's kind of struggling a little bit in that Bentley at the moment. We saw him losing uh, out to the Aston Martin previously and, and kind of getting hassled now quite heavily by Samuel, who's being held up quite heavily and, of course, allowing Enslin to then uh, enter into that little party. So, starting a three way battle perhaps. But yeah, that loud Bentley being uh, parked in the right places to just slow Samuel down, not allow him to pass. We see Brown going quite wide there. And I'm not sure if he's going to be able to hold off the aggression coming out from Samuel here. 
it's going to be super difficult to try and stay defensive and fast, especially at a track like Silverstone. As we see, you know, touching those curbs doesn't settle uh, the cars quite a bit as uh, Samuel now is being hassled again by that uh, Mercedes from Ensign in the beautiful South African livery, might I add. I yeah, no, it, yeah, I don't, I just don't think it matters what your nationality. Uh, a good livery is a good livery, and that really suits Indeed. that uh, AMG GT. Um, someone we haven't spoken about much at the moment is uh, Ezekiel Perez Compact in uh, position 23, who uh, uh, in a battle at the moment with uh, multiple drivers. Uh, he's one of our real-world drivers. Spent a lot of time driving for Grassa Racing Lamborghini team. Uh, I think he's taking part in. Uh, in the in a Mercedes this season. Obviously, we haven't seen any any much in the way of racing this season, so it's hard to tell. Uh, but I think I remember him seeing he's a, an AMG driver these days. So interesting that he's in a uh, in the Audi. Uh, lots of battles going on throughout the field. It's really tough to sort of uh, know what's go uh, really uh, where the main move is going to come. But uh, as we see, David Burketh uh, throwing quite a late move down the inside of Vicky Thompson, the RLM uh, driver. We've got Danilo Santoro now looking to regain some of those positions he lost at the beginning now hassling Samir Abrimi who uh, another team Redline motorsport driver so uh, one way or the other the uh, Redline guys seem to be on the defensive at the moment and uh, I'll let one of the uh, Redline commentators uh, opine on that <laughs> uh, very astute Chris but uh, actually I see and some of the more uh, observant viewers may have also noticed that we've had several stewards decisions ryan do you know anything about that yes i do uh car number nine the car driven by uh andy suchek has been given a drive-through penalty for contact with the number 52 ferrari uh that penalty has already been served and then there was the number three audi uh, that also had contact with a Ferrari. Uh, that was the number 51 Ferrari. And uh, the students have deemed that that was a drive through penalty as well for contact and not giving back the position. Uh, real world drivers once again getting into a, a little bit of a uh, bit of trouble. We've seen this uh, through a number of esport events. And maybe uh, I d I'm not sure any of us are really in the position to opine on why that might be. Uh, I suspect the. Uh, the fact that you've got much less in the way of sensory input than you do in a real car, you've got less vision, uh, may play a, a bigger role in that. Also, it has to be said, eSport drivers and, and sim racers race slightly differently to real world drivers. Uh, no matter how good the sim is, there are different ways of driving. And I think we all drive ever so slightly differently. So I think we end up seeing some of those real world guys getting into a bit more trouble, no matter the sim Chris, and no matter the event. Chris, I, I've always had something to, to sort of add to something like this, and I think it's because uh, when it comes down to it, you know, no real, no sim really simulates the real weight of the cars Ooh. properly. As we see a little bit of contact at the back there between the Bentley and I think it was uh, an Aston Martin. Yeah, it was Nestov in the uh, in the Aston Martin, wasn't it? Yeah, he seems to be he seems to be back on track. So it got spun around completely, he gets put back on to the track, but definitely one for the uh, stewards to just have a little look see at. Uh, as we follow along, Samuel still being bothered here by Enslin in that AMG, catching back up to traffic. The two of them kind of working their way through traffic together uh, and, and, and using each other's slip. I mean, Samuel really isn't using Enslin's slip. Enslin using Samuel's slip for most of the uh, most of the time. But we've seen this happen before. The car in front, if it loses out to a uh, loses a position, quite often the uh, door is there to lose out a little bit more. Well, right in front of them was Nesov, who we just saw uh, get that unceremonious tap from the Bentley as he uh, uh, was overtaken. So uh, that's why he dropped down a couple of places there into the clutches of Matt Samuel, who, as you said, is fighting a very defensive race at the moment. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Samir doing uh, a good job of keeping Danilo Santoro behind, who, as we know, is uh, one of the fastest guys in this race. We haven't mentioned Steve Strello in a while, who has just run away at the front nine and a half second lead now with uh, 20 minutes of the race gone uh, already lapping cars as you can see uh, eight laps Twi uh, what did I come what the gap was did I say uh, eight seconds nine seconds it was yeah that's uh, right nine yeah seconds in eight laps that's uh, 10 seconds nearly uh, now in fact that's uh, that's commanding there's no other way of uh, looking at that it's possible yeah. that uh, given that this is a 90 minute race he may have short fueled 
He may be running the car light in the first stint to, uh, to try and get clear, uh, which certainly wouldn't be the worst strategy in the world with a, with a busy grid like this. But, uh, wow, it doesn't look like anyone else has an answer at the moment. Yeah, he seems to have gotten away early on and uh, gotten himself some clean air. Uh, people who haven't had much clean air, though, is the pack of cars behind him. So, I mean, Chris Hockey, he's he's got himself a decent lead in front of Ibrahimi there. But as we ride on board with Tovenin in 11th place here, this, these Bentleys, I mean, we were talking about them earlier. I think uh, I wanted to also just add on to it. I, I feel like these cars benefit quite heavily of, of being able to abuse and use the curbs quite a lot. Uh, and in these kind of conditions, you're not really utilizing that to its full potential. I mean, the Bentley does love to be thrown over the curbs and uh, yeah, definitely not going to be used too much. And I feel like kind of not getting the maximum benefit out of the Bentley. Yeah, I mean, I've, I affectionately refer to it as the battle barge for that very reason. You can uh, really attack the curbs with it and it's a, it's a great car for all sorts of conditions but uh, as you say when you take away its ability to just eat those curbs uh, then perhaps it loses a little bit of its edge as uh, the Bentley is swarmed by uh, that other British Mark McLaren at the moment and very uh, salmon pink uh, 720s is not something I can say I've ever uh, seen before. Jesse, Jesse you've normally got uh, something to say about liveries of cars what do you think of the uh, oh Chris McLaren? you know me so well but before I do that I have to make mention that Chris Hay said that Steve Strello could have potentially short fueled his car just in case there's an inevitability that that does occur I don't want Strello coming for me but that all being said, I love the different colors of cars and the way that they can uh, make these colors pop and like, have their own identity. And by the way, you guys were talking about the South African flagged car earlier. I absolutely agree with you guys. I love that car. And uh, it's such a beautiful thing. And so is the salmon colored car uh, in front here. It's just fantastic uh, that we have that little bit of personalization we can do. And gentlemen, bad news, Ryan is back. Ryan? Yes, I have bad news for the number 24 car. Uh, the number 24 collided with the number 93. The number 93 uh, also being a Ferrari. Lots of Ferraris been involved in the wars early on here in the race. Um, but yes, the number 24 Porsche has been penalised with a drive through penalty. And I believe that car has now retired from the race. Uh, yeah, uh, Ryan, is it possible just to get an update on, uh, on or the, the Porsche was there? Sorry, it's not on my screen at the moment. Uh, the number 24 Porsche, I do not have the name at the moment, and since they've retired from the race, I think they have disappeared from the timing board. That would explain it. Okay, we have uh, what is affectionately known in the industry as a rage quit. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> just want to, I mean, in the real world, you know, the driver throws his uh, throws his gloves down in the corner of the garage and storms off to go and wait in the motorhome. In the simulated world, all you have to do is hit the power button on the PC, and assuming Windows Update doesn't get in your way, you're clear. So, uh, <laughs> just one of the benefits of eSport over over real world motorsport. There aren't many, but uh, but when they do come into play, they're uh, they're usually pretty instant. Uh, we're riding on board with James Parker, who is gradually making his way up the order. Uh, caught in a battle at the moment uh, with uh, Jardier and Absmeyer. Um, Jardier looks like he's dropped back a little bit. He had a, he had a gap in front of those guys. So as we've said, and I think we've seen throughout the field here, lots of small errors being made by pretty much everyone that doesn't have the surname Strello. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of evolution that can still come into this race. We're only 23 minutes in. Wow, it feels like uh, feels like a lot's gone on in that time. Uh, Jesse, can you remember back all the way back to the start? I sure as hell can't. No, not really. I mean, I definitely remember that uh, we had a very, very good start that second go around. And ever since then, I don't even recall the name of the guy leading the race because he's 10 seconds out in front. I don't know. But one thing for sure, there are a lot of good battles. And for whatever reason, they all seem to involve these big Bentleys like we're seeing here with Martinez. Just fantastic stuff. He's like, how in the world, guys? And this is a question for you two. How in the world do you take a car 
in these conditions as, as big as the Bentley and place it on a dime? How do you do that? Uh, sheer force of will, I think. Uh, no, it's genuinely a really forgiving car. It's a car that just will let you absolutely bring it by the neck. And uh, as we see Daniel Santoro breaking a little bit late into uh, into Stowe Corner there, always a, a bit of a, a bit of a dangerous one. He now comes under pressure from Axel Petit behind. We've seen Santoro's actually got past uh, Petit, oh, uh, sort of uh, passed me by there as he was uh, hassling Samir. And uh, that battle now uh, has Essa right on the back of it as well. So we've got a three-way fight in the final podium position at the moment. Oh, it's absolutely incredible to watch these cars try and find some position. Petit going to try and change up his angle of attack onto Santoro there, but not going to be able to uh, do too much. S is trying to hang on to the back of this uh, and see where he can try and benefit. But great bit of driving coming down. Santoro on the defensive, covering up the inside lines where he needs to do uh, everything that he can to hold off that uh, other Aston Martin behind of Petit course under fire from the Porsche as well down the straight they're going to have a uh, benefit of the slipstream before they're going to have to break quite hard coming down for this left hander doesn't want to leave it open uh, Santoro under attack from Petit you see Petit getting right up close tucking under that rear wing as they go back round for the right hander again before getting onto that accelerator trying to stay away from that curb as much as possible not wanting to lose traction but a great little battle uh, this would be for the uh, holding down of fourth place, which Santoro currently does. Yeah, it looks like uh, Santoro is doing a really good job of getting traction off the corners, which is just giving um, Petit a little bit of trouble uh, going past. I just want to say thank you so much to Simon for, for sticking with that rear wing camera and looking backwards for the entirety of that fight. That was fantastic and uh, good for a good sight there, uh, sticking on that. Because any time you watch that in the Formula One or other motorsport broadcasts they always cut away from those great camera angles just before the uh, the, uh, the move happens or whatever. so it was really nice to actually stick with it just to actually get an appreciation of where Santoro was placing the car where he was looking uh, as we see Santoro running wide through Stowe again it's obviously not exactly not the car he wants under braking at the moment it seems great under traction though so as I was saying earlier while these uh, this isn't the wettest conditions we'll see by a long way. It's just enough to keep the guys honest and just have those little mistakes. Yeah, and they'll obviously yeah. be pushing these tires to the edge of uh, their grip levels here. Um, obviously, there's still quite a lot left in them for now, but it will be interesting to see how they play their tire game uh, as things kind of proceed. These guys are obviously pushing things to the limit now which means that when there is going to be a need to uh, throw some new tires on, things could get pretty slippery and slidey and make uh, these attacks and defensive maneuvers a little bit more tricky for the drivers. Yeah, and that's something we haven't spoken about at all at any point on this stream yet. We've gotten 27 minutes in without having to mention strategy or pit stops, which is, uh, which is a record, I think, so uh, a sign that there's good racing going on. <laughs> But yeah, we are starting to get into that window where we might start seeing some early stops. You know, a, a stint length of an hour is doable in, in all of these cars. So, uh, you know, anyone that was short fueling, we could start to see coming in the next couple of laps. I would expect, uh, I would expect perhaps uh, to be waiting a little bit longer for the vast majority as we see uh, uh, Matushka is uh, still challenging Porter there. They've been locked in a, a little uh, inter-team battle uh, for a little while. Uh, and there's just so much, uh, so many battles still developing. And what I want to see uh, is uh, all of these battles resumed after the pit window. And I think this deliver this race format, this 90-minute race format, delivers more of that than the 60-minute Blanc pad races that we've seen in the real world, where quite often the battles in the one-hour-long races, the whole field gets sort of separated out after the first pit stop. And uh, the first half of the race is amazing, the second half of the race isn't so much. But with this 90-minute uh, format where uh, pit strategies are more varied, as we see, um, it's just going to get an excellent slipstream. He's going to have to try and go around the outside at Stowe. It's a long way around there, but he does have that nice, grippy Audi. But uh, a late braking Porter pushes, <laughs> understeers, and oversteers that uh, Aston Martin all the way across the front of the nose. Can Matuska go around the outside into club? That's going to be a long way around, but somehow he manages it. 
on the inside for the final part of club and it looks like very much like job done An excellent excellent piece of overtaking from matushka there that was brilliant stuff by wolf matushka who won six out of the ten races in tier two season two in acc rlm competition he knows his way around the track doesn't like the rain so much in the audi this season he's been very vocal about that that may not be the best car choice but in these conditions not a problem for wolf matushka he gets it done there what is and a problem for wolf matushka sorry to interrupt is uh gergo uh panko behind him uh, he's just popped off the screen but uh it's that he may have dropped back but was uh, just threatening him with top of the kunos devs uh, running in 17th place was uh, looked like he was threatening him along with uh, the Ferrari driver of Prenta there. So while Matushka was uh, holding very strong on the outside of the top 15 there, looks like perhaps maybe the tyre thing is coming into play as George suggested and uh, pace dropping off while those with uh, with a little bit more uh, little bit more to think about now uh, going forward. Yeah, it certainly could be that. And uh, just a couple of things, ladies and gentlemen, just going to explain. If you direct your attention to the scoring pylon on the left side of your screen, you'll notice that the majority of the drivers, actually all of which here in the top 24 you see, have a amber colored number one. Now, folks, that is the required pit stop. All of these drivers in this 90 minute race are required to come in and do a service. And I believe there is a set of parameters that they have to do to satisfy that they have done a pit stop or that they have uh, done the correct amount of service in that pit stop. When in fact they do that, that little one disappears and that amber light turns into green, which means that they are good to go and they have fulfilled that. So that is, and you'll see as some of the drivers lower down in the field who have already come in to make a stop, they have a green placard. That means that they're good to go and uh, we'd just like to remind everybody thank you guys for joining us here at redline motorsports on the streaming services and we'd like to thank you for that and also invite you to like and subscribe to the youtube channel and hit that follow button on twitch it helps us out a bunch with our server costs and everything else and we do appreciate you guys spending your afternoon or morning depending on where you are in the world with us here at rlm and with all that said Ryan, what do you have for us? I have news that the triple one Bentley had contact with the number 33 Aston Martin did not give back the position. So the triple one has received a drive through penalty and he went to serve it immediately. So he is now back out on track in 34th. That is absolutely a shame, but it, uh, it does happen. It's, it's great to have these live stewards. These live stewards are watching the race. They have the ability to replay the race and make judgment just like you would in a normal race in real life. So we have that instant feedback, and that is fantastic to have that. And uh, thank you to Ryan, who's with us here, to explain the rules and the penalties given out in this race. It's always important here to have a fair and concise sort of uh, environment to race within and we certainly have that as we're taking the helicopter view now as we're looking at james parker in the number 44 mclaren who is attempting to chase down the what is that the number 90 looks like the number nine aston martin an aston, there 100 that's the uh, number 90 aston martin jason absmeyer a uh, esports driver from south africa representing white rabbit esports these three have just been hanging on to each other. This little train has probably been the most consistent train we've seen here. Uh, for, this is the battle for 7th, 8th, and 9th. And really just keeping things neat and tidy together. Not quite finding a way past Jardia is Jason Absmeyer. And uh, it looks like Parker not managing to find a way past Absmeyer. So all three of these guys just keeping things neat and tidy, lapping at around the same sort of lap times. And uh, yeah, just... A great bit of driving you want to see this i mean there's still an hour left to go you, you you start to find a rhythm and these three seem to have found it early on and uh, a great little uh, bit of driving we can always jump back to it and, and see what's happening uh, three cars on camera all the time yeah it looks very much like uh Jardier might be the cork in the bottle here a little bit he's been uh, hounded by absmeyer and parker as you mentioned uh for, for a little little while now maybe the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes and uh, perhaps uh, that uh, that smiling face of his might be uh, looking 
more under pressure as uh, it looks like uh, that Aston Martin and McLaren aren't really going to be going anywhere as we uh, have uh, some lap traffic in front. Or is that uh, Samir's drop back a little bit as well, maybe? We're now looking at Gergo. We talked about him earlier, one of the Kunos devs, the uh, livery editor, pounding the back of the Ferrari of Prenta and Porter, who we saw uh, being overtaken by Wolf Matushka a couple of laps ago. This battle still uh, raging on there. Not a lot to separate between them. And it looks like Gergo has found some great pace in these conditions and a uh, wonderful showing showing up the Italian devs uh, and what they can really do as they uh, try to fight their way through <laughs> through maggots. Gergo, uh, one of the friendliest people I've ever met, uh, quite unassuming guy, uh, doing a pretty good job of hounding Prenta there. It's like uh, he's got uh, he's got the sights set on uh, set on kill, I think. I, see, yeah, I said our previous battle was uh, one of the closest on track, but look at Panka here going around the outside, was kind of faking for the inside line, now going to get a little bit of the cut back through Stowe, and great bit of driving coming out here on the edge of the grip levels, and that Ferrari being forced onto the inside line, no, Panka going to try uh, go for the uh, inside line there, but great bit of defensive driving coming out from Prenta in front there, and uh, just keeping Panka at bay, not allowing him to capitalize or fare any of that slipstream that he got up the end of the hangar straight and going to be forced to tuck back and wait a bit but here's Essa. Essa may be having a move here on Petit hasn't had many opportunities before and trying to find a way past back onto the brakes going to try and come on that inside line get on the power early on try and close down that gap back onto the back of Petit's Aston Martin as again just struggling to get past his Essa. Again, these two have been knife fighting it out since the start of the race and continue to do so. Yeah, I think Essa's the driver that's most impressed me so far. Well, you could, to be fair, I'd have to include, uh, you'd have to say Strello, <laughs> 16 seconds ahead up front. But uh, Essa uh, qualified outside of the top 10, has made his way through the field and uh, is hassling the, the very uh, well-prepared esports drivers here, uh, lead of the real driver race, or class I should say, within the race, and has been hounding Petit, who it has to be said has done an excellent job of defending. Uh, going back to your previous point, George, uh, during the, the previous battle where we were seeing uh, was it Panka and uh, Prenta uh, fighting out, Prenta was having to go defensive every other couple of corners and was losing huge amounts of time slowing up that whole uh, battle and in fact it looks like Vit has got past Panka the, uh, the pink BWT uh, sponsored uh, Audi has uh, gone past Panka who's actually uh, looks like he's retired to the pits for some reason uh, I'm not sure what happened there uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing from Ryan at some point in a few minutes time with an update on that but uh, going back to that but we've got Porter in the, uh, the Aston Martin who's been uh, the slow sort of cork in that fight now very much under pressure from Prenta looking uh, to run down the inside or the outside down into club corner, but no room this time around. This As he gets hit, unfortunately, from behind by, uh, was that fit in the Audi? I couldn't quite see uh, who made contact there, but that's uh, robbed us of a, a very close fight, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah it doesn't... Sorry, Simon, you go Yeah, I just want to quickly just jump in there. Yeah, yeah, Jerga didn't actually retire to the pits. He's just gone in for his pit stops, and that's what he's actually done there. So that's why ah. he's lost the position. Well, there you go. Perfect timing. If you're being held up by someone that's losing a huge amount of time being defensive all the time, you're quicker than them. Get the stop out of the way. Get it out of the way early. You're still going to complete the uh, race with the same amount of fuel overall. You're just going to lose that low fuel advantage that you might be carrying. So uh, potentially a strategic move there for Gergo Panka. And from the, uh, the warmth of the commentary box, uh, with no pressure on my decision making, I can confidently say that that's probably what I would have done. Oh, I see. I like I like your style, Chris. I like your saying. I do have some bad news about Panker, though. He was, in fact, doing his routine pit stop, his mandatory pit stop, I should say. But uh, a bit of a pit lane infraction, I'm assuming. That's how you get that stop go 30 by your name. Perhaps released the limiter too early. That's the easiest way to get that penalty. So that's unfortunate. Just a mental mistake or maybe a button press mistake. But uh, that's not going to deter Panker. He's going to get back out there and he's going to hound some more cars and get some more positions. And Chris, to your point earlier, you're talking about him uh, 
man. Uh, oh, as we're actually on board here with Pintos. Pintos is under attack from Martinez. Martinez sticking his nose in there to the inside. He gives up the inside. It's Bentley on Bentley. Just a wonderful sound hearing these two. And that's how you get it done. Happy birthday, Martinez, as he makes the pass and gets through. That's an excellent move. But now, if you're Pintos, you got to worry about Matt Samuel, the drifty boy behind him there. Can he potentially get a run? Doesn't look like that's on the cards in this corner, but it certainly looks like he's hounding the back of Pintos at the moment. But just a fantastic overtake. Just stuck Martinez, stuck his Bentley to the inside and got that move done. Yeah, it looked like uh, Pintos was struggling to get the power down coming out of uh, uh, Luffield 2, as they used to call it. It's just Luffield 1 corner now. But uh, struggled to, as we go back to SA again, in the slipstream of Axel Petit. He's going to be forced to try and go wide around the outside of Brooklands, but it's just not going to happen there. Although Petit runs wide, you can sort of take that line through there without risking anything. Luffield, you can pretty much take any line you like through because it's such a long looping corner that you're going to be on the apex at some point. Uh, and it's all about just getting down on the power. Essa does get that uh, the power down well, as the Porsche often does, but you need such a good run down the short, old start, finish straight, to be able to do something down into, um, into Stowe Corner, and once again, just not quite enough in the tank. Essa definitely looks like he's the faster driver, but he just can't quite get the job done. I 100% agree with you. It feels like he, uh, he he catches right back up, but Petit just using that esports knowledge, uh, keeping the the real life driver at bay at that point. And uh, as we look over at Strelo on stream at the moment, doesn't really get much time for us to talk about him and his number 69 Aston Martin, but really just. Uh, miles apart from everybody else at the moment and yeah, just loving job, the, the no, current uh, conditions good job there's no sponsors on the car otherwise they'd be upset by the uh, lack of tv time as we we're watching Alaric enslin uh, battling it out with nesov as we saw earlier in the uh, south african livery uh, amg mercedes looking fantastic uh, again seeing with that run down to stow just not quite long enough for these gt3 cars to get the move done there hanger straight that seems to uh, still provide a lot of the goods as does the run down into uh, Brooklyn's down the Wellington Strait. And we've seen some really good opportunis uh, opportunistic moves into Village and the loop corners, the, those fiddly little slow uh, first and second gear corners uh, in the middle of uh, this layout lap. So uh, plenty of places to overtake at Silverstone. It just seems the place that the, uh, the Porsche in particular is strong coming out onto that, uh, the old start finish straight there just doesn't have enough room to get the job done. George, I actually have a question for you because uh, what car would you pick to race here? And keep in mind, we are looking at insulin right now. And if you pick anything other than a South African flagged Mercedes, your, uh, your home group will not appreciate that very much. But seriously, what car would you pick in these conditions? A little light drizzle, okay? And this track with these drivers, what, what car would you personally want? Uh... I, I'm a big uh, Porsche fan. I would I would definitely be in the Porsche. Um, there there are some South African liveries for that as well because obviously we had the uh, Kyle Army Nine Hour and we've got that featured in the game. Uh, so there there are some uh, South African flags on some Porsches. Uh, I know that we've got Kelvin van der Linde's uh, Audi in there as well that I could pick. Um, so really, if I was going just on livery, I'm I'm spoiled for choice as a South African. You got me, George. You got me. I, I thought I had you, and you got me. It's fantastic. It's just. You can put that flag on any car and it looks good. Yeah, I think uh, I, I would, uh, uh, I, Sorry. No, go go ahead, Chris. I was oh, I, I was, was just going to boast about our flag. Oh, it's a good flag. I mean, for, you know, uh, from a design perspective, I think you guys nailed it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I was going to make the point that uh, the car that I would choose isn't actually represented in this game, uh, in this in this race at the moment, is uh, which is the BMW, which is uh, quite slow at most hmm. tracks under the current BOP. But at Silverstone, it's quick, and it's the car I'm quickest in at Silverstone. So I would sneak in at that, and uh, you know, I'd still be in like 38th place. But uh, you know, I'd be happy with <laughs> do you. Do you do you think that's got to do with some of the uh, the top end on that BMW? Because I mean, at Paul Ricard, that thing is also uh, absolutely it uh, is. insane. It's partly that, and it's also partly to do with just it's so stable through. Uh, 
long sweeping corners, which is also why it works well at Bora Garden. So when you're going to senior corner and uh, Bosse, half of that, both long right, uh, right hand corners. As we see Essa once again fighting down the Wellington Strait, trying to find his way past Axel Petit. He's never going to make it round the side. <laughs> We've seen that move happen three or four times. Axel Petit just has enough in the tank. As he actually gets a slight run around the outside of Luffield, that can allow you to get on the power a little bit earlier down onto the old start finish straight. And that Porsche has great traction, as demonstrated there. Is he going to be able to find enough room down the inside? It looks like it at the moment. He's now got the inside line for Stowe. This is the move that's been looking to be happening for lap after lap after lap. Down the inside into Stowe. Takes a lot of curves. Somehow manages to... Uh, give each other quite a lot of space but he's gonna be on the wrong side for the first part of maggots but he is finally after 15 or so laps made that move stick and that is a move of a racing driver awesome Ooh, stuff yeah it's just chris I just want to jump in there looks like ryan has got some uh, new steward news for us so I'll let him come in Yes, I do have uh, quite a bit of news to report, actually. So, Car747, which is uh, Alessandro Porter, he has received a final warning for unsportsmanlike behaviour. So, he is currently under strict supervision from the stewards. Uh, James Parker, actually, car number 44, he was involved with Jason Absmeyer um, down towards Brooklyn. Uh, that is a 15-second penalty that James Parker will be receiving come the end of the race, so that will be added on to his race time. And then it was car seven was involved with car number 10. Those two were Ferraris, I believe. Yes, uh, it was car number... Actually, they've disappeared off my list. Um, it was Premta that was hit by car number seven. He was a blue flagged car and uh, he received contact from, I'm just checking it now, it was Cairoli um, that ran into the back of Prenta and uh, the stewards have decided that that was a drive for penalty. Under strict supervision from the stewards there, that's uh, not something you hear very often, but we did see that incident with, uh, it was Porter, I think you said, Ryan, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we saw, we saw that incident, certainly the last of those incidents on the stream, so perhaps not entirely surprising to see uh, at least a, a slap on the wrist coming. But uh, yeah, as you see, James Parker has now dropped down to 24th place. So uh, as a consequence of that, uh, that incident, I think, uh, at Brooklyn's, as Ryan was saying. So uh, yeah, lots of action still happening. 45 minutes left, and we still haven't seen the majority of pit stops. Looking like uh, quite a lot of the fast guys are going long. Yeah, certainly one thing, guys, that I'll be looking out for is Martinez, who's currently in 20th place in his Bentley. but. He was one of the first of the faster guys to come into pit road. So for those of you guys watching at home, pay attention to the currently 20th place car of Martinez because he came in first. And maybe if you're trying to do the undercut, maybe that works. Certainly we've seen the overcut work as well. It's all going to come down to what you do when you decide to pit and what you do when you pit. Of course, you have to meet a minimum criteria, obviously, but to, you can do extras and Wow, it's been an interesting 40-some minutes to this point, and I'll just start with George. George, what is your takeaway from the first half of this race? Uh, the first half has been absolutely unpredictable. Uh, it's been insanely close racing between what uh, I would have thought would have been more split up between the uh, eSports pros and the real-life drivers. But obviously, uh, the real-life drivers putting in some real time and giving us some real interesting battles on track even if it's amongst themselves uh, obviously you would expect the esports drivers to be good at their own craft i think if we were to throw these uh, you know virtual drivers into real life cars which they would probably love um, i don't think they would uh, be able to hang on quite as well as uh, you know the, the real drivers hang on into the sim um, on top of that uh, a bit of a surprise coming in of course from uh, esso who, who did a great job he's gone into the pits now but um that's yeah, obviously going to change up the leaders. order. Grello has pitted as well, and uh, he's in the pack a little bit, as is uh, Essa. Unfortunately, he's caught uh, right behind Nesov in sort of 16th and 17th place. So both uh, uh, the drivers we were mentioning, Strello, the race leader, and Essa, have uh, pitted and come back out into traffic. So those that can run a little bit longer now have, uh, have an advantage, although we now see second place Danilo Santoro. Uh, coming into the pits as well, which gives uh, Chris Hoker the lead. Uh, so if he can run a bit longer, then, well, I, 
just repeating myself really, aren't I? <laughs> so this is where the strategy game starts to play out. And uh, I'm going to throw it over to Jesse to make some uh, wild predictions. Who do we think out of the front pack is going to be able to run longest? Making a habit out of this, mate. It must be said. Uh, I think uh, I think Chris Huke will absolutely, probably, certainly, Chris, please, cr please don't... Uh, don't make, turn me into a liar here. I think he'll probably go the longest because he has now been the guy who's been running in second place. He's inherited the lead. He knows what his competition's doing. So if he can go longer, why wouldn't you? Go as long as you can. Try the overcut. Try to get it done. As we're seeing a battle here for what would be 20 position between James Parker and Pintos as they are side by side here. He's going to try to go around the outside, James Parker is. Can he stick it out there? Yes, he can. And now he's going to have the advantage for the inside. Pintos just kind of lets him go there for the second. He's going to try and get back in line and get a run on him. Can't quite get it done. And there you have it. Another pass at that particular location at the end of the lap. Fantastic don't stuff. See many moves around the outside of Brooklyn. So we saw um, Essa and Petit going, uh, trying that lap after lap, but they're not going off for that. McLaren just had so much grip on the outside line there and the outside of the Bentley. Okay, Bentley probably needs to work a bit harder to get that uh, big sort of front engine weight into the corner, but James Parker doing a fantastic job in the McLaren around the outside there, carrying a 15 second time penalty, as you mentioned. So we're not uh, necessarily battling for that position at this stage, but uh, James Parker once again finding himself fighting his through the field. His teammate, yeah. Chris Hoka, having no such problems at the front, though. Sorry, uh, I've uh, cut you no, off please. there, Jesse. <laughs> no, uh, Chris Oka, as you predicted, still going and uh, now finally comes into the pits. Did a couple more laps than the leaders. I feel that's not going to be enough for him to be able to uh, dent that lead that uh, we saw Strello built up, who's uh, found himself a little bit of space, actually, although quickly catching up Porter ahead of him. Um, Axel Petit down in 15th place uh, has found himself a little bit of uh, room as well so uh, actually for the leaders other than when they uh, i think when strello immediately came out of the pits most have found themselves just a five second or so gap to uh, slot back out into so perhaps uh, not too much penalty for uh, time in the pit stop on there thankfully so uh, i don't think anyone's gonna be made a liar jesse <laughs> no, certainly not. Uh, it, it's it's all in good fun. We're having a lot of fun here today, and I just want to talk about something that happened earlier, or actually right now. We're gonna we're looking at Absmeyer, who is all over the back of the team right now. This is fantastic stuff as well. Doesn't try to go around the outside, but these two Aston Martins. This is a close battle, but uh, do you know how mental it is? folks at home think about this for one second these are esports pros who are racing with real life drivers that they almost certainly have seen on television and they're going wheel to wheel in a sim and it's just it's great and, and and we've seen it go both ways where the real driver wins out and the esports driver wins out and that's why we put on these events that's why we want to do this because it's fantastic to see that you you have all sorts of drivers in this race mingling with each other racing with each other and it's putting on a spec spectacular show george what do you think yeah i i mean i i can only uh sort of fanboy out uh, as much as possible and try and contain the excitement in my voice i mean uh, not just real drivers but you know the uh the influence and influences uh, i know a lot of people don't really like that term but uh you know those are those it's are the mostly influencers that don't like influencer <laughs> correct I, I think chris is one of those people um but for me to also uh, commentate alongside you know the likes of chris hay on an event like this uh, just absolutely uh, an amazing opportunity for everybody involved and yeah i'm uh, i'm trying to contain my excitement even more but uh, what a great event it's been and still 38 minutes left to racing i'm trying to contain my excitement at the moment as we're watching davide brivio uh, make few little mistakes there. He's the uh, marketing uh, manager amongst one of his many job titles at Kunos Simulazioni. So this is his uh, this is his sim. So uh, I'm sure he'll be uh, very upset with himself for uh, making those mistakes as he's uh, battling out through the field. Uh, speaking of uh, one of the last to pit, Alex Buncombe, the uh, leading real world driver at the moment, um, in position seven in the uh, Team M Sport Bentley, uh, obviously one of the, the real world guys that we've been keeping an eye on throughout this. Bentley supporting this race uh, very nicely from their social media stuff, so it's great to see. Uh, he's running very long. He's going to be one of the last to pit. We've still got uh, 
Samir, Torvenen and uh, Porter as well ahead for the eSport drivers who've yet to fit. But some people trying to run this very late. We're watching this excellent battle with them in battles. Chaser and uh, every other car on the circuit apparently behind him trying to get past. So Chris, you, you, we talked about Essa and his pits and getting caught up in traffic. I mean, he's currently getting very, very caught up in traffic at the moment. So I think for him, his pit stop not really working out for him. Strelo, his seems to have worked though, out so... a little bit better. But yeah, Essa is getting caught up in a lot of traffic down towards the back of the pack. Oh, well, what's interesting here, just means... they've been leapfrogged by Torvenen. You're absolutely right. Um, so I uh, know uh, oh, that's the uh, that's me getting caught out by the leaderboard updating just as I was talking. But uh, yeah, Chris Hoker is uh, about a second and a half ahead of Essa. He was about two seconds ahead before the pit stops. So uh, and Essa is a second and a half ahead of Santoro. So. Um, they were a long way behind Strello, but they were a long way behind Strello before they came into the pits. So, actually, I'm not sure how badly it's worked out for uh, Essa. Yeah, it might not have worked out too bad. It might have negated itself a little bit. Like you said, Strello was just miles ahead before. So, uh, his runaway and, and where he comes out is kind of probably going to be a big gap anyway. But uh, with guys still to put, anything can still change. And obviously, with 35 minutes left of racing, uh, anything can happen with a little bit of light drizzle out at Silverstone. Yeah. I'll tell you what, the big loser here is Axel Petit, who is just watching down in uh, eighth place, as we're seeing uh, as I hear Essa go past uh, a lapped car there, I think, in his battle. But they're, they're, they're like all, all lapped cars to me at the moment. Uh, as he battles with Chris Hoker, who's the Porsche at the front of that picture. So the number uh, eight Bentley is not uh, not on the same lap, so presumably he'll just go yeah, out of the way back down into pits now. Um, as I was saying, Axel Petit down in 12th place was battling with, with Zahir before the uh, the round of pit stop. So uh, being four or five positions behind now uh, has not worked out too well for him. Obviously, we've still got Alex Buncombe to pit, who was that pitting Bentley we just saw there. Um, Samir Ibrahim, he's picked up a stop and go penalty, presumably for the pit stop that wasn't there before he pitted. That's uh, a real shame for him. Uh, a 30 second stop and go penalty is going to effectively remove him from the running. Uh, awful, awful news as we start to see the last of these strategy pools play out. Yeah, we would be remiss if we didn't mention for all the fans out there that Jardier is actually leading this race right now by virtue of not pitting. He's the first car that hasn't pitted. There's uh, what uh, about two that haven't up at the front of the field before Strello retakes it over. But Jardier is leading this race. He's the de facto leader. And he's had a very solid and quiet, as I like to refer to it, a very Jardier-style race. Very quiet, very, very, very well-paced. It's a bit of a bump there between Asmeyer and I believe that's, uh, yes, that's, that's so uh, yeah, that's a little uh, little scruffy there. But uh, again, no harm, no foul, really. You just give a little bump and you uh, keep going. Certainly the stewards will probably want to look at that. But uh, well, plus I have, we have actually, You've made a good point there, actually, I think, uh, Jesse. Something we have yes. seen throughout this race is a number of small contacts that haven't resulted in spins. So you get a little bumping in racing, you know, rubbing his racing and all. And uh, ACC, even in the slippery seems to be behaving quite well uh, with these light contacts. You quite often see in racing sims where small contacts due to things like net code and stuff can result in horrible spins, but uh, it seems to be yes. behaving itself really well here in a, a much more convincing way than we've seen in a lot of other sims. Recently. So I, it's very pleasing as a commentator to see that because you don't like to yes. see an incident like that where there's a light contact and then the other guy has just a really clumsy spin because you know the physics have just gone slightly outside of the operating window or the net code is is off and it's not really showing you a representation of where the sim thinks the car is so just great to see a close quite aggressive racing uh and it all working out really well uh, back with essa again uh who is the story of the race for me now two tenths of a second behind chris hoker uh, we saw them battling their way through traffic and uh Perhaps not so surprising to see a real world racing driver having the uh, having the advantage there as he feels the need to weave a little break the toe from Santoro who uh, gets a good run and is going to have to try and go around the outside of Stowe Corner. We know it's a long way around, but somehow he's made it work. That Porsche turns so well, it's never going to happen. They both run out onto the tarmac on the outside. Is there going to be a comeback into Club Corner? No. 
good luck for SL managing to keep that all together. Positioned his car excellently in the defence. We thought he was going to be making a run on Chris Oka, but it was actually Daniel Pintoro in that uh, Aston Martin, which we've seen be really good down hanger straight throughout the race, uh, looking to move forward. And I, yeah. I think a little yeah. bit of uh, real life racing driver intuition coming out there to abandon the attack on to uh, Chris Oka there and to, you know, go on the immediate defense of Santoro, who, if uh, Issa hadn't positioned his car there, would have most certainly gone around the outside uh, and taken that position off. And those are the kind of little bits of, uh, you know, racing driving that are interesting to see. Um, and here we've got a real great battle. Uh, between seriously fast real life racing driver and real life uh, pro esports drivers. Yeah, there is no doubting that Essa's race, this race has been absolutely exemplary. There's uh, nothing I could fault during any of that. The these battles that we've been watching with him have been, uh, well, I'm he, he's made a fan in me, driver, particularly before this event as we see Jaka Torvenen. Uh, running past, uh, I think there's Martinez ahead of him, oh, although that may actually be a lap car. That, I'm talking rubbish, that's a, that's a blue flag situation. It was an exciting looking blue flag situation, but it was uh, a blue flag situation nonetheless. We didn't mention Jardier earlier, as, uh, as Jesse pointed out, running 23 seconds in the lead, still has a stop to make. But the point I wanted to make here is he's running in the AMG Mercedes, which is, I think, the thirstiest car in the game. Somehow he's been driving around, uh, saving fuel, uh, driving quite conservatively. Now he's gonna he's gonna lose that first place to Steve Strello uh, because the pit stop here is much more than 23 seconds. But it's very interesting to see how this long run, uh, this long fuel saving run, goes out as we see Zahir again trying to go around the outside of Chris Hoke, coming under pressure from Daniel Santoro on the run down to Club Corner, going around the outside of Club's doable. We've seen it once, but not if you don't, not if you break as late as. Uh, Essa does excellent defensive work again, excellent attacking work on Chris Hoka. This is a great battle. Right. Yeah, Chris Hoka loves this. He's like, hey, if you guys keep battling, maybe I can get out a little bit of a gap here. Seems to be his only uh, chance because these guys are, are they're, keep in mind, guys, these guys are battling and they're keeping up with him here. And certainly Chris Hoka does not want to lose that podium position, so he's going to be defending as much as he can. But uh, this onboard shot, I love this onboard shot of Issa looking back at Santoro. And this this is interesting. This is the part where they, they, they've not been this far apart for quite some time. And that battle cools off for the moment. And Issa now closing up ever so slightly on Chris Huke. And that's just fantastic shots as we're seeing here. Uh, seems to be about stabilized uh, that gap there as we go back to Absmeyer, who perhaps is having a look on Sebastian Brunier. And he, in fact, is Absmeyer, go, Absmeyer going to the inside. Okie dokie, indeed, gets it done. No big fight. Uh, if I know Sebastian Brunier, I know that he didn't want to fight there. He'd rather just slot back in and get back on pace. But well, really he's yet, all to, he's yet to pit, so there was no, he wasn't really fighting with with. Oh Mason yes, there, you're so right. Having not come into the pits, there was the smartest move for him was to get around that corner as quickly as possible uh, without having to worry about another car trying to overtake him. So uh, very smart racing there from a very accomplished uh, long-term driver of, uh, of of racing sims and ACC. Uh, we're looking back at uh, this fight. It looks like Essa has uh, regained some of that gap on Chris Hoker. Again, uh, he looks like the guy with the pace at the moment, and uh, perhaps Chris Oka, who we saw very quick earlier on in the race, uh, doesn't have the answer at the moment. As, uh, Essa gets a great run through Stowe Corner. Is he going to be able to do something into club? Feels like I've been saying that lap after lap now. He tries, has a little look around the outside, but that's not going to happen there. We saw Essa lose a bit of time last lap, having to go very defensive against Santoro. Not this time around, but this, uh, this is spicy. So what I loved, what I loved there from Essa, we talk about some real life driver um, technique was how he just kind of stole that line from Santoro that he's been under attack with before at the end of the hangar straight, stole it straight from Santoro, threw it at Chris Hooker, and now they're going to go side by side once again, Santoro on the inside of Essa, Santoro going to get the work done while we watch the rear facing camera, the Porsche wing covering up that Aston Martin who has now replaced the uh, Porsche of Essa in that position for fourth. So Chris yeah, Hooker holds much. on to third. 
What a great bit of driving coming out. Yeah, there wasn't much Essa could have done there. He found himself uh, with the Porsche of Chris Hoka uh, at his turn-in point. So he had to leave the, his turn-in a little bit later, take the apex. And, well, when you do that with Daniel Santoro behind you, you're going to find the nose of an Aston Martin at the inside. Great job by all three drivers to, uh, to keep an eye on each other and, and not make contact. As we've seen, very respectful racing between all three. But uh, I suspect that fight is far from over. Guys, think about what we just saw there. We saw an eSports pro overtake an actual pro in a simulator. That's so cool to see all three of those drivers, eSports pros and real racers, racing each other with complete respect and command of their equipment and just putting on a fantastic show for that podium spot as we are now watching Wolf Matushka, who's going to be trying a outside move on Ebrich right now. He can't make this work, can he? But he's certainly trying as he hangs tough on the outside. He just about clears him, can't, runs wide as they go up to what I assume is Maggots and Beckett's, and it is. He will have the inside here, and I think he'll have it done, but just look in the background. That's Elvin Smith, who's having a look on <laughs> on Ebridge himself, and they are side by side. And you do not want to be side by side in Beckett's, but they are. And again, clean moves, but it isn't over yet. I don't think, unless that's a back marker and it isn't, is it? I'm unsure. No, exactly. the, uh, the, bent, the Bentley is uh, of Martinez's fight. Uh, interestingly, that I think that's, wow, that's uh, <laughs> that McLaren 720S went there. Uh, Excellent camera work by Simon again. I think he uh, he deserves a cookie at the end of this for catching. Oh, this. absolutely. But uh, I think that might be the second time we've seen Matushka go round the outside in that um, in that Audi of his. Somehow finding grip around the outside of those fast sweeping corners. Excellent car position from both. And uh, once here we go, Daniel Santoro looking to go around the outside of. Chris Hoka, we, this has been coming for a while as they uh, try that move around the outside of Brooklyn's that uh, we've only seen happen once, but every driver's tried it so far. Uh, Essa still in that fight. Uh, Hoka really looking like he's struggling with the uh, the heavy fuel load again. Um, he, Hoka had a bad exit. You just saw him uh, get loose in that Porsche, and that's going to just allow Santoro to uh, pull alongside him here. Chris Hoka going to have that inside line. Santoro going to struggle all of them running very very wide Essa the widest carrying probably the most speed I'd be surprised if he didn't get a warning for uh, exceeding track limits coming out of there and that's obviously also something these guys want to consider right uh, not pushing things too hard and, and suddenly getting a, a drive-through penalty right at the end of this hour and 30 minute long race yeah that's not the way you want to you want to end that Mr. Martin starting to loom large in the, uh, the Porsche, he's a little bit too far back this time. The Chris Hoka feeling the need to go defensive into Stowe anyway. That leaves him vulnerable on the run down to club, as we've seen before. Can Santoro run around the outside of club? We've seen him try it. He's probably got the best position he's had so far. He's got a nose ahead, but it's a long way around the outside there. Finds the grip, manages to make it happen, and then has the inside of double left coming up. And of course, Essa is just going to follow him through doesn't quite manage to make it happen but we've seen Hoka on the outside there may have had to have risked lifting or get a cut penalty I think he kept his foot in there and just uh, and kept the, uh, the the one warning point he was likely to get from that clever bit of defensive driving there I think from Chris Hoka uh, I think also good respectful driving coming out from Essa there he definitely gave a little bit of a lift to allow Hooker to get round there safely so all three of these drivers just showing so much respect giving great on-screen battles uh, between them and it will be Santoro coming away on top. I'm pretty sure Essa wants to fire back. We saw him having a battle with Puke earlier and these three really have given us such a nice on-screen battle uh, towards the last closing stages of the race. Yeah, I don't want to come across as uh, as being rude to my hosts at Redline Motorsport today, but I'm really keen to see Essa get past Chris Hogan to see what pace he has and whether he can take <laughs> the fight back to Danilo Santoro. Uh, sadly, Hoka doesn't look like he has the pace at the moment as we see Jaco Torvenen in the M Sport Bentley gently cruising his way uh, past Brunier, who uh, still yet to stop in uh, in that uh, in that car there. So uh, we've still got Brunier in the 777 car yet to stop running 
very lean on fuel. I think I can, Lord knows what fuel mixture he's running, but uh, he's definitely going on a uh, save the planet run rather than uh, a hot lapping expedition by the looks of things. As we once again follow Zahir Essa getting a good run out of uh, Beckett's and uh, Chapel Curb onto the hangar straight. Doesn't look like he's quite close enough this time, but if he forces Chris Hoker to go defensive for the sort of 80th lap in a row <laughs> down into Stow Corner, maybe he can get something done into club. Not quite close enough this time, I fear. Yeah, that's uh, this, that battle is going to persist because Chris Hoke is a fantastic defensive driver. He's a great offensive driver, too, not to sell the man short, but uh, obviously he is where he is because of his driving talents. As, oh, my goodness, what do we have here? We have uh, insulin here. Yes, that's exactly we what have, we're looking We have a looking story at. is what we have. We have yes. These, uh, Bentley uh, factory drivers of Buncom and Andy Suchek. Uh, fighting it out with Enslin in the uh, rather fetching looking AMG Mercedes there, it has to be said. Uh, for 23rd place, uh, nice to see the two uh, factory Bentley real world drivers on track together. Uh, Andy Suchek not having entered yet, uh, running very late in the race. We said that Alec Buncom, uh, Alex Buncom sorry, was, was running long, but his teammate uh, running very, very long. As we see Davide Brivio, uh, the Kunos dev, getting into the wars with the uh, the bright green uh, Bentley that we've seen uh, causing, uh, involved in a few little bits of uh, scuffle there. I think we haven't put the end of that, so I wouldn't like to assign any uh, sort of causation. I'm looking at Phil Vitt again, uh, Printer in the Ferrari, been, these guys have been battling it out for what feels like about 45 minutes as well. There's a lot going on, guys. Yeah, these two guys are going to be absolutely sick of each other after this race. They've been nose to tail for, it seems like, since the green flag dropped. But uh, just a bit of housekeeping to keep you guys up to date. Jardier has, in fact, came to pit road. Whatever hypermiling he was doing, not quite as effective as Sebastian Brunier, but uh, Jardier has come in to the pit road. He has filtered back out into fifth place, which is roughly where he was running to begin with. But as we critically, now... only two seconds behind this fight for third yes. place. Chris Hoka and uh, Zahir Essa now joined by uh, the ever-present threat that is Jardier. Uh, this, is, uh, this is getting good, this. Once again, it's that outside of the... This is what happened in Kyle Army. It's the last position of the podium that is generating the, the best fight. Uh, we didn't have someone go, uh, go and pull out a 25-second lead like Steve Strello, uh, who obviously uh, got up and had some sort of special prep this morning because he's on another planet uh, in terms of pace for the, uh, compared to the rest of the guys. But uh, the pace of everyone else <laughs> this is very close together. Yeah, it certainly is, isn't it? As we uh, ride, or we don't ride on board, we ride high above, looking down at Phil Vitt in the very pink uh, Audi that he is in as he continues to hound Parenta. But now's the perfect time to, to re- mention that we are red line motorsports and we thank you guys for taking a part of your day to be with us here and would like you to leave a like and subscribe if you're on youtube and if you are on twitch leave a follow uh, every little thing every little bit counts and it helps us keep our server costs under control so we can put on more of these fantastic races and share this excellent stuff with you guys thank you very much for being with us and uh, we hope that you have enjoyed and continue to enjoy this excellent race that we have here. Of course, we have George Smith and Chris Hay who are commentating today and Ryan on the uh, on the penalties and Simon, who is being the most excellent director I've ever seen, giving us looks exactly like this. Wolf Matushka looking back at Cheezer right now as this battle continues. This is for the top 10. Speaking but, of excellent uh, stuff, so much, I'm just going to uh, interrupt you there, Jesse. Speaking of excellent stuff, as you said, we saw the best overtaking move I've seen in a long time where Wolf Matushka and Elvin Smith dived up the inside of Brunier, who admittedly has yet to pit. Uh, just had one hell of a late move from uh, Matushka, and Elvin Smith followed him through on the inside there. We saw Elvin Smith pull that late overtaking move into uh, Village Corner earlier and seemed to uh, sort of do the double there with uh, following Wolf through. So uh, as you say, right up onto the outside of the top 10, they've caught up with Chesia and the uh, Porsche as well. So more to come from these two guys who've uh, put on a great show themselves this afternoon.
I would like to know just how some of these drivers uh, are still continuing to push out there, uh, you know, at this stage of the race without having done a pit stop, without having put in any fuel, without having changed the tires. Uh, things must be getting quite hair raising out there with the 17 minutes left to go. That's really, really pushing things to the limit in these I cars. Think someone, someone must have entered the Konami code. And make it, so there's, <laughs> uh, there's uh, some hacks going on, definitely. No, I mean this is it. I think there's uh, some of these cars. We see our oh, Matushka. Was it Matushka? No, it was Vit and Prenta who've been fighting it out for ages, uh, having a bit of a clumsy getting together on the outside of um, on the rundown between Stowe and Club Corner. I think that's been a thing that's been threatening to happen for a while as those two guys uh, have been fighting it out, as Jesse said, getting sick of each other. I imagine they're less friendly than they were two laps ago. Yeah, that's not exactly what I meant, Chris. I just, but uh, there it was, just a just a bit of a mistake there, and uh, that uh, that's unfortunate that that happened. But it it certainly has. It I think we'll see that. Uh, is, who's that? That's Porta behind him, isn't it? Yeah. So that's made that's helped him close right up to the back of Prenta. So we've got Porta and Prenta, which is not at all difficult for an English speaking person <laughs> to say. But uh, that's just all that's done, really, is uh, unceremoniously unceremo so deposed of it, but given this battle new life. We have been racing now for about an hour and 15 minutes, with 16 minutes left of the race to go. Uh, it's uh, gone by in a flash. I remember saying that after about 25 minutes into the race and thinking it was about lap three. Uh, the, the mid portion of this race has been full of interesting developing battles. Uh, and it's probably probably a nice time to reflect as some of those have calmed down a little bit now uh, just on, on some of the great stuff we've seen obviously that fight for uh, the third place uh, has been a big story as has uh, uh, Zahir Essa making his way up from I, I really need to uh, go and find out what his qualifying position was, because I think he, was he started I think he started P6 Chris P or, or, oh, okay. or somewhere there he was he started Maybe quite he quite after, well down after the first lap or something we saw, yeah sort of he, he lost out quite heavily and uh, yeah, it just looks like every time we've watched him, Cameron has been uh, putting on a masterclass in either uh, passing or defensive driving. So uh, a lot to be uh, thankful for for his participation in this race. Jardier, uh, another great story there, kept out of trouble, uh, was running around in fifth or sixth place for mo much of the race, ran long, uh, quite a long way back from the battle of the guys in front of him, was found himself. Uh, is that a replay of Porter? No, that's uh, Porter. He's got himself uh, together with Prenta. Uh, unfortunately, Prenta, oh, two laps in a row, ends up in a, an act club corner where I, I wouldn't like to assign blame in, in either situation, but the poor guy's been hit two laps in a row. <laughs> so uh, that's all I'm going to say. Um, yeah, not a great couple of laps for the Ferrari driver. No, certainly not, and uh, certainly the stewards, the live stewards we have, will certainly uh, see what uh, needs to be done. In that case, it's the beauty of having such a thing uh, as we have here at RLM. So that's that's that done and dusted. But up front, we do have Steve Strello, who is pictured here. As Chris pointed out earlier, it's uh, thank goodness he doesn't have any sponsors because we certainly wouldn't have been seeing him much on the broadcast he has some 27 seconds of lead over second place santoro who it must be said fell back through the field just a little bit at the start of this race but has made his way all the way back up to the second position and chris huke has made his way back up to third as it turns out so that's fantastic as we're now watching wolf matushka who is still attempting to get into the top 10 as it appears chisa has went on the grass a little bit, but none the worse for wear as they all reset to not as they run down into this set of corners. That is, uh, go on. We've all seen the famous Porsche 911 or the Porsche based rally cars. That, uh, oh, yes. rally car, but, uh, did they ever do a rally cross car? Not sure they have, as we uh, have Wolf Matushka now still being uh, hounded by Elvin Smith trying to get past uh, Chaser in the Porsche. Uh, in battle let's talk about strello for a moment there this is a guy who has been uh, it's pulled out a 26 or 27 second lead now in 37 laps that's what, seven eight tenths of a lap quicker than everyone else consistently let indeed sometimes a driver and a car 
and a setup all just come together at a time and it was just much quicker. I commentated on a, an SRO esports race last year where uh, Kamil Franchek, uh, who was the eventual winner of the series, uh, was uh, racing at a wet Nurburgring, somehow three seconds a lap quicker than all of the other pro esports drivers. He was just on another planet. He was only in those track conditions with that car on that day, he was that much quicker. The rest of the time, it was tenths of a second between them. But somehow just managed to hook it up and it seems that's what's happening with Strello here, Jesse. Yeah, Steve Strello is just made of different stuff. I mean, he, he's a fantastic driver. He, he's excellent to uh, have in your race. He's very knowledgeable. He's very smart about his movements. And he just loves to come out here and put on a show, and he certainly does. And if he hangs on, and by hang on, I mean, you know, he's got 20 eight seconds a lead but if he continues to win this race and he actually crosses the, the finish line here first this will be a major feather in his cap he'll talk about this for a long time hey you know that day that i beat pros and other esports pros that was a cool day raining at silverstone definitely one to bore the girlfriend with isn't it uh speaking of nothing of the sort we just Axel T's cruised up to the back of uh, Jardier. We saw Axel uh, perhaps lost out in the pit window. He was very much fighting for the podium positions in the first half of the race. He's now cruised up behind Jardier, and that looks like one of the big developing battles. Speaking of which, uh, James Parker now back up behind Absmeyer. We saw him down in about 25th or 26th place 10 or 12 laps ago. Obviously, a couple of people have pitted in front of him, but uh, doing a great job of recovering which uh, sadly seems to be something I say every time I watch him race. When I, do, when I don't commentate on a race, he is uh, cruising around at the front, one of the fastest guys, quite often picking up wins. When I get in the commentary box, he has uh, an absolute mare, as they say. So it uh, <laughs> looks like a couple of penalties have been uh, issued there. So I don't know if we've got Ryan uh, to uh, update us on that. Yes, uh, I am here to give you the rundown on what's been going on. So uh, a couple of people have picked up some stop go penalties for speeding in the pit lane, unfortunately. I think Darren King was one of the drivers uh, that unfortunately picked up one of those. But uh, update um, regarding some stewarding penalties. Um, Petit in car 996 has been given a final warning. And the same goes to Enslin in the 29 Mercedes. They're both on their last uh, warning before they receive a penalty. Uh, Kart 747, uh, which is Alessandro Porter, he was given a final warning earlier this race. Well, had contact with car number 10 uh, and did not give the place back, so they have given him a drive-through penalty. Yeah, that was the incident we saw with uh, Prenta in R2 came together. Uh, and then I think Prenta got hit again by someone else the following lap. Uh, so uh, bad uh, bad time for, for Prenta and a bad time for Porter, who's going to have a drive-through penalty, which is going to take him out of the running. Uh, good times for uh, Elvin Smith, who is still nailed to the gearbox of that BWT Ferrari of uh, Wolf Matushka. Still, they're stuck behind the Porsche, and they have uh, caught up with, uh, with uh, a lapped car. Uh, yes, it is about to in front of them, so that's uh, not really worth talking about. So I'm going to hand it over. <laughs> that is, it's fantastic. I mean, we're here, we're inside, folks, the final 10 minutes of a 90 minute race. And it's been this light drizzle all race, and it's not really, it has slowed the times a bit, but they're still out there on slicks. And there's been very minimal incidents as far as uh, weather related ones and uh, driver to driver incidents as well. And it's just that's what you get whenever you have that combination you have a lot of these battles that will continue throughout the race and case in point we have Parenta here who is trying to get around Ebrich right now as they are nose to tail they couldn't fit a piece of paper between them for a second and now he's going to try the outside move we've seen some drivers pull it off isn't to be here as Parenta falls back in line he's going to try and get the better run out of the second half of the chicane nothing doing as Ebrich covers him and he'll have to reset and try that again as he runs wide a little bit, gets it back on track. He's going to really go for the inside move here. And he's going to try and stuff it down the inside. And he's there. He's got the move done. Happy birthday to Parenta. He gets it done. And that is what that's perseverance. That's what that is. Yeah, I think Beautiful, uh, Rich, in the uh, in the uh, salmon McLaren, let's, let's just call it what it is, uh, had, to, uh, had to back out on the sideline there. 
uh, as uh, I, I'm sure I you just interrupted George saying a beautiful bit of overtaking work by uh, by Prenta, who has been in the walls a little bit, but it has to be said, positioned the car beautifully and sort of scared that McLaren out of the way almost. Yeah, I just loved how um, we've seen that chicane kind of uh, bode well for people trying around the, out around the outside. Ebrich there did a good job of defending the inside line and extending quite deep on the exit. It wasn't enough to hold Pinter at bay, of course, but um, just a, a good bit of driving coming out at the end of it all. And uh, it was nice to see Ebrich trying something else uh, to go on the defensive through that chicane and, and not lose out around the outside. Jimmy Park has cruised up to the back of the battle between Jardier and Absmeyer. Looks like we just lost Jardier around the outside there as so I sort of blinked and missed what was going on. Literally blinked, but it looks like uh, Jardier ran a little bit wide. And now James Parker takes the place. And, uh, well, that uh, looks like he is the guy with all the pace at the moment, which makes that 15-second penalty that would be applied at the end of the race all the more. Yeah, it certainly will want it. It's not exactly ideal, but as we're jumping around this battle, by the way, guys, this still persists. How long have we been on this? Elvin Smith and Wolf Matushka. Wolf Matushka is not going to want to give up that top 10 spot. And Elvin Smith says, well, I want that top 10 spot, so I'm going to keep pursuing you here. And, and of course, uh, Wolf Matushka will still uh, pursue the ninth place of Chiza right now. But th this is the way they've been, and it's it's been all about not making big moves or, or big mistakes, and none of them really have. And that's evident by the fact that they're all still there as we Sorry follow to Jardier. Sorry, speaking of no, big please. mistakes, I made one a moment ago and we, uh, by the timing screen, and that was a, that was just a, uh, a back marker in an AMG getting out of the way of Altmaier and Parker. It wasn't Jardier who is on the track by about 14 seconds. They haven't cruised up to the back of that particular battle. That was just uh, the cruelness of numbers playing yeah, devilish tricks on me <laughs> it happens to the best of us all of the time part of live broadcasting in motorsport and you know what else is a part of live broadcasting uh, stewarding ryan yes i have some updates for you pintos in the number 77 bentley uh, was about to get a warning for dangerous driving and uh, then he decided to collect the number 44 car along with him in an incident so the stewards have upped a warning to a drive through penalty as for car number 42 which is the Mercedes of Fuminelli he blocked a three-way battle uh, between th uh, three cars that were a lap ahead of him uh, he let one car by and then proceeded to block uh, the second and third cars in that train for about half a lap, refusing to let them go, weaving and moving in the braking zone. So he has been handed a drive-through penalty as well. Glad to hear it. Uh, you know what? I really like uh, the efficient stewarding uh, that's happening here. Uh, I hate when I'm watching uh, a race and it takes half an hour for a steward's decision to come through. Uh, you know, uh, and that's one thing I do like long pan series or the gt world challenge europe series as, as it's now called um it's uh, as we're watching and eric enslin uh looking like he's gonna make a uh, move up the inside of porter porter have been involved in uh in moves uh, up and down the field <laughs> all day it would seem doesn't quite get the job done can he make a move up to the inside of club not quite close enough this time now sorry to go back to my original point the uh the fast-paced stewarding decision very much reflecting what happens in Blanc Pan. They don't mess about their uh, penalties for the kind of things that we've been hearing these penalties for all throughout the race are handed out very quickly, efficiently, and without the sort of petty squabbling you see in other forms of motorsport. So it's uh, very good to be involved in an event where the stewards are decisive and everything is just sort of resolved quickly so we can get on with the race. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, to have that efficiency and also have a, a, a steward here that explains clearly and concisely exactly what happened, exactly why the penalty was given, or exactly what's going on, just to keep you folks at home in the know as well. I mean, and us, you know, as well. Like, we all want to know exactly what happened, why the things happened like they did, and it's fantastic to have that. And uh, three minutes of the race to go getting on to about 9 p.m. here at the Silverstone uh, that we have. We have Vicky Thompson, who is looking to make a move on the number 33, Aston Martin. Ducks and dives, doesn't quite get the move done, but still right on the bumper of that Aston Martin. 
and we'll have to see if this amasses to anything on the other end of the straightaway doesn't look like it at the moment uh, so george uh thoughts on the race thoughts on uh, what transpired uh, did anything surprise you today uh you know what i've i've just had a quite a great uh, experience being here and watching some of these guys go around of course um as a uh, lonely South African fanboy here, I can uh, say that I'm very proud of uh, S's drive as uh, a real-life racing driver representative. Jason Absmeyer, another South African esports pro there, sitting at sixth place. Um, a great battle going down uh, really across the board. We currently look down at Parker, who's, who's been hassling on the back of Absmeyer for the entire duration of the race, unfortunately picked up a bit of a, a penalty there. Um, but just kind of looking around, Thompson here has been battling or giving Nesov quite a uh, quite a handful of defensive work that needs to be done. And with, you know, two minutes to go around the outside, Victoria Thompson trying her luck uh, at the last possible minutes. And, and really, that's what being a race driver is all about here, is uh, if someone makes a mistake and leaves a, uh, an opportunity for you to try and find something, uh, you take it and that's really what we've seen here where there have been opportunities drivers have taken it's respectful driving uh, across the board really and uh, a great bit of uh, entertainment for the afternoon slash evening slash morning depending on where you're watching from yeah i, I would echo all of those points we've had uh, some fantastic driving standards throughout the field we come into the last minute of the race and uh, james parker nearly up with the so uh, unfortunately, he had to get off of the loud pedal, which is going to compromise his run down into the club corner. As we've seen so many times, the run between those two corners can be where all of the action happens, but not this time for James Parker. And uh, I'm not sure if he's going to get another lap. I can't see where uh, Stu Stello is uh, on the lap at the moment, just to know whether we're going to get another one or not yet. We will find out. I think out. we are going to get one more. He's coming round. Yeah, Stu we'll Stello, more. by nature of the fact that he's 30 something seconds in the lead, has given. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sure James Parker will be happy to hear that, uh, as well as many of the other people still in battle. Looks like the battle between Chris Hoker uh, and uh, Essa has sort of cooled off a little bit, and they settled for the uh, final podium places there. Jardier is in a pretty solid uh, and safe fifth place, but it's really that battle between Parker and Absmeyer that is uh, where the where the action is at the moment. And of course, this battle that we're watching between Victoria Thompson and Nesov. Looks like Thompson is uh, the one with the pace, but uh, running out of corners to make the move happen. Yes, indeed. It certainly seems like that, as it looks like Vicky Thompson's trying to go around the outside and says that I've seen Wolf Matushka do this. Can't quite get it done. Now goes to the inside. Can this be the move? going to be on the outside of the chicane here. She's still level with him, and she's going to have, if she can keep it on the island, and she can't, Oh, that was so close to coming off. She breaks so tantalizingly late. It's a good half a car length later than Nessar, but it just wasn't quite enough. As we see, uh, Absmeyer. Uh, is that Jardier? That's Jardier. Just, that I is Jardier. I made this mistake a couple of laps ago, and I don't want to get to Absmeyer running onto the grass, onto the hangar straight, because he came out of chapel there, desperate to pick up a position. Johnny, I must have had a mistake, or running low on fuel or something, who knows? Probably not fuel, given that he's got pace now, but they've only got half a lap to make this all happen. We're gonna be seeing Strello coming across the, uh, the finish line very shortly, I imagine, but this is the battle, as we say. Uh, Parker looking very opportunistic at the back there in that fast-looking McLaren 720S. Uh, he might not take a risky move given that he's got a 15 second penalty. Then again, he might just do it anyway. Who knows? I certainly don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's all coming yeah, down to it a little bit. And there you have it. We just got in time. Thank you, director. Beautiful job. As we saw Steve Strello win this race by some margin, he'll be absolutely thrilled with that. Not only did he win the race, he was the fastest qualifier and outlasted everyone and uh, fought Santoro at the beginning. Santoro had a race where he fell through the field a little bit, but came all the way back to finish second. Excellent job. Chris Huke in third place and Issa in 
fourth. That's fantastic. Our first runner Parker of the real drivers. The outside, desperately trying one last move. It's going to be very difficult to run around the outside of. So I think Jardier will hold on to fifth place, barring some sort of divine intervention at this stage. And Jardier bringing the car home in a very respectable fifth place from Absmeyer just behind and James Parker not quite getting the job done. In fact, he did get ahead of Absmeyer right at the end there. No, my okay. word. Timing screen uh, craziness uh, tricking me once again. Uh, I think my initial <laughs> prediction of the. Just a note as Elvin Smith comes along, uh, he's picked up a five second penalty at the end there, must be for some sort of track cut or something. Um, just a couple of quick notes there. Yeah, excellent recovery drive from Santoro. Uh, we saw some decisive overtakes. We had to overtake both Essa, uh, Indeed, in that brilliant stuff. move, and Hoka, which we didn't see on camera to regain that second place. As you said, um, Jesse, he lost out of the, the first lap and spent the whole race regaining that second position he started in kept his nose clean wasn't the most exciting race to watch from him on camera but an excellent job nonetheless uh, and the same from chris hoke actually who looked after the pit stops like he was going to drop out to the back of the top five didn't have the yes. pace perhaps he to keep up but he brought home that final position ryan would you happen to have the last possible second uh penalties Yes, I do. So, uh, Elvin Smith, as you did uh, point out, had a five-second penalty. That was for contact with uh, Davide Chiesa, uh, the triple two Porsche. Uh, there was contact at the end of the hangar straight, which allowed Elvin Smith to get past. Uh, Chiesa did not lose too much time after the contact. And uh, considering that Elvin Smith had been involved in an incident uh, just a couple of laps earlier in which he was given a warning for, the stewards decided that uh, it was worth giving him a five-second penalty at the end. Phil Vitt as well, the number 303 Audi, he received uh, a 15-second penalty for contact on the final lap oh. as well. Bad timing for that to happen, but just looking at the, the results there, some other interesting ones to highlight. I think uh, Alex Buncombe, the factory Bentley driver doing an excellent job in, in one of his first eSport outings that I've seen, certainly bringing it home in a very respectable 19th place. His pace looked pretty good throughout the weekend, seemed to do well, particularly battling it out, as we saw from all the real world drivers. But uh, yeah, uh, Zahir Essa uh, just doing an excellent job uh, representing the real world motorsport community, bringing home fourth place, could so easily have been second place if uh, a couple of those moves had gone his way. Uh, but uh, excellent defensive work from both Santoro and Hoka sort of put an end to his run. Uh, for me, other than Strello's uh, monstrous uh, run at the top, uh, for me, it's Essa is the driver of the race. What do you think, George? I think you have stolen the words out of my mouth. So here is a driver of the day. Um, I, I can't really add too much because I just sound too biased, uh, you know, having <laughs> predicted that uh, he was the guy that I'd want to see representing hard from the real life driver's side um but a great a great race overall and really just indicates how close everybody was i mean parker who uh, fought with um Absmeyer to the line had that 15 second penalty uh, and got jumped all the way down to eighth place you know so really just uh, showed how um interestingly close these drivers were 15 seconds sounds like uh, this 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 amount of time that you would kind of be okay at towards the end of an hour and 30 minute race uh, you wouldn't expect to just lose four or five places right at the end so not right not uh, not with five seconds that's crazy uh i totally yeah. agree we should also mention jardier who um was running in i think about sixth or seventh place for for part of the early stint after uh, after a pretty uh busy first few laps for most of the guys uh ran very long and uh kept his nose clean somehow uh came out ahead through all the pit stops and uh finished in a very respectable fifth though i'd love to know how that 14 second lead he had over the guys behind eroded itself in the space of a lap yeah absolutely so yeah very interesting race i mean that was absolutely awesome <laughs> non-pot action literally for the last 90 minutes there so I have to say, I'm very impressed. Unfortunately, we obviously had that um, that first restart within sort of after T1. Um, I said on Hangar Straight, there we had about 15 car pilot. It wasn't actually shown on the stream. Um, so yeah, that was the reason why we had the restart there. But yeah, just where we did, because I mean, 
the race as we've seen seen this then for the last 90 minutes has been absolutely awesome i mean yeah i mean chris obviously you've obviously commented a lot of uh, or commentated a lot of uh, races um especially the live events for sro and stuff so uh you know what, what's your take on this race today honestly um it's been non-stop action uh we all love to see a race at the front uh but equally it's great to watch uh, a performance particularly in difficult conditions like these uh from someone like steve strello who just he was just in a class of his own today and you know you have to respect the craft it's perhaps not the most exciting thing to look at but thankfully in a field of 50 cars you don't have to have the excitement generated from the guy in p1 and the battle for third place as we saw in kyle army was intense and it wasn't really until the last handful of laps that uh that that battle just dropped down to just being three people so uh, i think that uh, the two events that i've done for redline motorsport have been uh, followed a similar format where the just the the battle for the top has been so intense and so close that just the tiniest margins uh, make all the difference and that is why i think you should run in light rain all of the time <laughs> just to <laughs> create some of those little 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 uh, errors between drivers so we can uh, see it all mixed up but Absolutely. no, this was a joy to commentate on, guys. Uh, thank you so much for having me as part of the team. No, it's been it's been awesome to obviously have you, you know, Chris, to obviously commentate here. So yeah, no, thanks for your help today as well, and obviously thanks to George and Jesse as well, obviously commentating as well as obviously the uh, live streaming team, uh, Ryan and Fabian there in the background, and a couple of others. So yeah, appreciate obviously you guys doing that for the stream today. Um, just to get you guys, let you know before you do disappear, we have got our Super Bowl. Um, qualifying next uh, saturday so we got uh, on the 11th of april so yes we've got that super pole going on so that's going to set the grid order for our big 12 hour race we got so that's a proper full 12 hour race uh, going on the 18th of april there so yes super pole for uh, next weekend and then the week after that it will be the um the main 12 hour race so do obviously stay tuned for that one there so that would be 2 p.m bst um on this saturday and then the main race starts at noon uh, bst um on the 18th of april there but yeah no honestly guys i mean thank you for coming along to see this uh, stream today it's been absolutely awesome to obviously have you all there i understand there's been a few problems with mics sort of going up and down the volumes and stuff um I, I guess obviously for the 90 minutes obviously some of us obviously had to sort of sit away from the mic in places um and obviously that's why the volumes were going up and down but yeah unfortunately um we, when we tested it did seem to you know be well but anyway um right yeah okay anyway, just to say thanks a lot again guys and we will see you again soon so thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, George. Cheers. Thank you for having me, guys. Cheers, Absolutely a pleasure. Mm -hmm.